We're talking today with Lee Wichiscott of Bridgeton, New Jersey, and the interviewer is James Smither of Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Lee, can you start us off with some background on yourself uh, to begin with where and when were you born? Well, I was born in Bridgeton, New Jersey, uh, raised in the uh, little town of Rosenheim, uh, which is about, uh, well, maybe seven, eight miles away. And uh, I grew up there, went to school, and uh, graduated from high school at Bridgeton High School, and then from there, I what, what what year did you graduate from high school? I graduated in uh, 1964. Okay. And what was your what did your family do for a living while you were growing up? My uh, father was a uh, carpenter. Often uh, he was a construction foreman. They did work that he did. Uh, a lot of schools, uh, commercial buildings. Uh, actually, he started his career working on the Delaware Memorial Bridge as a as a laborer. So he's been all he got around quite a bit. He originally came from Finland in 1937 uh, and then he ended up actually he ended up in the army he got drafted like a lot of other people mm -hmm. and got his citizenship my mother lived was raised and born uh, just about a quarter mile from where I live today and that's how my father met her because his sister lived across the street from where we live now and there weren't many people around and so they hooked up and uh, eventually got married and then my dad built a house after I was born, and it's on part of the uh, estate. So that's, uh, and we have a, we had about a 20 acre piece of ground. Uh, uh, Mom and dad had a cow, but we had our, had our own milk, made butter. And then uh, in the 50s, everybody in that area of uh, South Jersey was raising chickens because it was big money in eggs. So they put up a chicken coop, had 500 chickens, and we would uh, pick the eggs and you know clean out the chicken coop every other year because then the chickens would get too old and you know, all that. Now, is that area still fairly rural, or is it more built up now? Well, it's more built up, but uh, compared to everything else, it's still pretty rural. The land I have, I've now bought the land from my parents, and uh, it's two acres less. But my sister has a house and a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, right around us, it hasn't changed a whole lot. In fact, across the street where my aunt and uncle lived, um, the state bought that and tore the house down. So it's a nice view now. Okay. So it's gotten, it's getting better. <laughs> all right. So it's not necessarily what what one, one thinks of one thinks of New Jersey if you're an outsider. It's not all built up. And no. Uh, when I went to when I went to college, people said, uh, "Where are you from?" I said, "New Jersey." It was. No, where, where, where did you grow up? I said, New Jersey. Said, but you don't talk right. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I was from the, from the southern part of the state. I said, we talk more like Philadelphia. Oh, no, you, you, you know, what, you know, I can be able to say Joyce and you know, mm -hmm. have a harsh accent. I said, that's New York area. All right. So, uh, so where did you go to college? I ended up going to college at Colorado State University. Okay. And, and how did you wind up there? I went there because I wanted to major in wildlife management, wildlife biology. And uh, when I was looking through the uh, brochures, because I asked my uh, counselor in school, and they said they said, gave me a blank look and said, uh, "Here, take these brochures. Look through here." <laughs> and I came up with about four, five or six different schools. Uh, some I eliminated. One eliminated me because I wasn't southern enough. And <laughs> and this is back in the '60s when racial things were going on. So. Mm -hmm. They just didn't want to deal with anybody from the north. Uh, and then I got it down to the three schools that had the curriculum that looked like I'd be really interested in were Colorado State, University of uh, Montana, and uh, Utah State. And I ended up in Colorado State, which I liked of the best of three, but they were the only school that would allow, and this is 64, that would take, actually in 63, that would take an application from a non-resident prior to graduation. Mm -hmm. So the other two schools, I had to graduate and then apply. So I applied to Colorado State in January. They accepted me. I never applied anywhere else. I figured that's good. Right. And I went. The first time I saw the campus was the day I signed the papers when I got there right. in in uh, September. And my mother drove mother and I drove, drove me out. Said got me to my dorm. Said well, see you later. Uh, see you Christmas time. And that was. And that's the way it was. We didn't. Uh, it, it was not expensive by today's terms, but you know, 
fairly reasonable, and, and uh, yeah, I worked in the summers. My parents paid for most of it, and uh, that's where I started. Now, were you required to do an ROTC program because it was a land grant school, or there was they gave you an option, and you could do either ROTC or you could do phys ed for two the first two years. Well, I looked at things. I said, all right, I know, you know, everybody's subject to the draft in those days. You had to sign up when you turned 18. So I figured, well, I don't see any reason why I won't get drafted at some point. So I may as well sign up for ROTC. It gives me a, a little more of a uh, cushion because you got a better de deferment. So I signed up for ROTC. And then, and it's really not signing up as such the first two years. All it is is taking the courses. But at, at the end of the second year, then you have to sign commitment papers and you'll say, I am signed up and I'm going in the Army. And at that point, if you drop out of school, you immediately go into the Army. You know, or if you flunk out, you immediately go into the Army. So I signed those papers, but the, the advantage of that is they also paid me 50 bucks a month, which is, when you consider that my tuition for a quarter, and we were a quarter, I think, system, was $1,300 a quarter, 50 bucks a month is pretty nice chunk yeah. of change. Okay. Buy a fair amount of food or whatever yeah. else. Yeah. And so, so I signed up and then, um, and I also participated in uh, one of the, they had a, a ranger section, so I participated in that and I also ended up um, participating in um, a drill team for a little bit. I don't know how I got in these things, <laughs> but <laughs> somebody else was saying, oh yeah, we're just, this be good. Oh, good idea, I'll try that. And so that's what I did, and uh, then finally, uh, I had I had some trouble in school. There were courses I, you know, some of the math courses were killing me. I finally got through them, and then I had to had to take a, a, a soils course. It's a six-hour course, and uh, you know, you went every day, and it was I really had a tough time. So I had to take that over. So when I take these other courses, I ended up going a little longer than I would have. So I ended up actually going for an extra two quarters. So I didn't graduate until uh, March of 69. Okay. Now, one of the things the Army does, uh, you also have to spend six weeks in uh, basic training for officers. Okay. So now, what, is this after you graduate or while you're still in ROTC? While you're still in ROTC. And so I did that in the summer of 68. And I went down to um, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas. So, and it was very interesting. They, you know, it's it's basic training. It's it may it's probably a little different for officers than it is for enlisted men. But it was six weeks and it was over with. And then I then I came back to school. And in the meantime, they said. You know, they're saying, okay, what units, what, where would, what would you like to serve in? Would you like to be artillery, chemical corps, MPs? You know, they have all they have the list of different uh, units, and the uh, colonel that uh, was in charge of our unit said, oh yeah, boys, uh, you know, get your three selections. You know, it's a wish list. He said, he said, he said, but you have to have a combat branch is either your first or second choice, which I found out was not true. <laughs> but I didn't know that at the time. So I looked at the different combat branches and I really wasn't interested in anything. I said, well, infantry, that's it's close to what I could understand. You know, I, I run around the woods all the time. Ah, this infantry, I put that second. I think my first choice was, uh, I think I asked for chemical corps. My third choice was MP. And I was looking, and those I picked based on what I thought I'd be doing after I left mm -hmm. the Army. Because I, I had worked two summers with New Jersey Fish and Game, and I worked a bit with chemicals, uh, and actually uh, foliage control, which really, you know, it turns out Agent Orange, fair, that's a fairly good mix. Mm -hmm. And then I also knew that if I couldn't get a job as a biologist, I could probably get a job as a conservation officer. So if I got in the MPs, that would give me a background to make, make me more desirable to, when I went to look for a job. So I was, and then the infantry was, I didn't see myself riding around tanks or art, didn't like the artillery and uh, engineers and then, and then, and then. You had enough of the mass at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Although in reality, none of that would have happened, but it's just the concept. And that's so, so 
needless to say, I was fortunate enough to get infantry. Okay. <laughs> I want to back up a little bit here. What did the ROTC curriculum actually consist of? The first two years are sort of classroom? Or? Most, most of it's classroom. Every year is classroom. Okay, you so know, there's some drilling, uh, but it's classroom work. They go over the basic Army procedures. Uh, they, you know, they do stuff on, on some of the uh, you know, tactics, but it's very, very broad. And, uh, and you learn, you learn you know, what's, what's expected of officers and, and how, the, how to treat the enlisted men. And, you know, some people don't pay attention to that. But, and that's, it's very basic information. And uh, if you remember everything, you're good. And then when you go to uh, the basic course in the field, then you actually get to uh, call in airstrikes, uh, adjust artillery, and things like that. And they don't just let you call in airstrikes. Mm -hmm. They just got somebody listening, make sure you give them the right coordinates, and you know. But and so you get a feel for what's going on. And they and you also try out the various uh, uh, armaments that you're likely to encounter. As a, by that time, I knew it was going to be infantry, and so they they gear you towards that. And then when you graduate on, on graduation, with, because I graduated in March, there was no ceremony for the, in the school. But the army had a Ceremony and, and for those of us who were all going to be officers, they had they you know gave us our bars and uh, our commission and then and the first orders and the first orders had show up to Fort Benning and right and at Fort Benning they rehash everything you did for four years they do it in nine weeks. Okay. Uh, now you had mentioned that when you did your original sort of basic stuff at, at Fort Riley, you had the impression maybe that it was a little more laid back than it might be somewhere else, or? Yeah, I, you know, and I, and I, only from what I heard afterwards, uh, you know, to me it was, it was not, it was not stressful, there was no big deal about it, so uh, it was just. And, and when you were doing that, that was all ROTC guys? Yeah. Okay. They were all guys from different schools, some from the same school. But, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we ended up, you know, and you, you can see, you end up having, even though we're only together for six weeks, uh, our company ended up having a little bit more a spree, and we got together, and uh, we were being inspected by some second lieutenant ROTC, probably, giving us a ration of crap about, you know, as he called, you know, you got gnarlies under the, under the bunk beds. And he said, gnarlies? He said, yeah, that dust stuff. You know, oh, dust bunnies, no gnarlies, they're gnarlies. <laughs> and it gave us a, so we had to clean the whole place over again, you know, that kind of thing, and then wax the floor. And they were planning to tear these buildings down at the end of the year, but <laughs> nothing new. But as a result of that, one of the guys in the groups, and he was very good at caricatures, caricatures and so they made a banner and had a, a caricature on there and called ourselves the gnarlies. And from that point, and we carried that with us wherever we went, and as that, and so whenever we competed with anybody, you know, it was always go gnarlies, and <laughs> so you know, which is what the army really wants. They like the fact that you, everybody's working together, and uh, and it was just interesting. Uh, we did, you know, we, you know, we took it that all right, he's a ch he's challenging us in one way, but we took it that way, and it worked out very well, you know. So we had, a, and overall, it was a fine time. Okay. Now you're going through college and you're going through ROTC at the time when Vietnam really happens. Because in '64 we don't really have ground troops in right. there. Right, and I can tell you that in '64 I did not really anticipate going. Ah, they sent me someplace, but I didn't really think there was going to be getting shot at. Mm -hmm. Not '64, but. <laughs> now, did you pay attention to those developments as they unfolded? I was paying more attention, yes. And after a while, by the time '68 rolled around, I said, "Oh." <laughs> This is going to be very interesting, and I and I and the fact that I had to go an extra couple months in school did not disappoint me, you know, because I was thinking, well, maybe they'll finally get this thing settled, and I'll, you know, and I'll miss it. I wasn't anxious to go out and get shot at, or you know, but you know, but I, you know, some, and then they then they did the uh, lottery in '69. Well, I was already signed up, so it didn't matter. But I never. People said, what was your number? I said, I don't care. I didn't want to know. <laughs> right. It's, okay. Now take us through the, the infantry basic school at Fort Benning. What was that experience like? That was, uh, it was interesting. It was, it's very similar to the, uh, 
to our, you know, the other officer training that I had at uh, Fort Riley, but the biggest difference was I didn't have to stay in the barracks uh, because you were now officers, so you went, to, if you went, you could go to the officer barracks, or and I, I was married at the time, so I went home to be with my wife, and then we come back in the morning, of course, be early, and uh, there's lots of PE, but I had always done pretty well in that. I ran cross country in high school, so, you know, people are dying on the run, I was, you know, yeah, we'll run some more, that's okay. So, it, you know, that part was kind of fun. We ended up with a captain of our company who had been a staff sergeant in Vietnam and got a field commission to captain. Mm -hmm. And then they brought him in, brought him back to go through the officer basic training. But since he was there, they also made him in charge of our company. And he was a very interesting person. And uh, we, we did some uh, uh, field training exercises with tactics and whatnot, and he was in charge and uh, we were doing, you know, setting up ambushes and stuff like this. And working with him, uh, you just you really felt that here's a guy who knew what he was doing, and you felt that whatever he decided was going to be right. And uh, I thought about it years later. I said, you know, if, if I was assigned to him, I would have been very happy. I also felt that if I was assigned to him, I probably wouldn't have survived. Because <laughs> he was doing stuff that was dangerous, but he was good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I, he was supposed to be going back to Nam after he wanted to. He is, you know, and I never couldn't remember his name, and I don't know whatever happened to him. But apparently, somebody said he was up for, you know, Medal of Honor, or you know, and if you were field promoted from E6, you did something in the field, mm -hmm. you know, that probably would rank pretty high. Do you have a sense of how old he was at the time that you worked with him? I had a, he, to me, he felt much older than us. Uh, I don't know how old he was, but I would say he was probably just, he was much more worldly than the rest of us. You could see that, not only at his uh, army knowledge, but you know, when he talked about women and things like that, it was like, okay, he's been around a lot longer than the rest of us. <laughs> but uh, he probably was only a couple years older than that. You know, he might have been about, he might have been 24, right? you know. We okay. were all, you know, 22, 23. Right. Um, all right. Now, with your group, uh, did you have reserve officers or academy people or anyone else with you? It, we were, no, we didn't have academy. Academy people always went together. Okay. And uh, we had all, as far as I know, they were all reserve officers. And we also had some um, foreign officers that were training with us. We had some from Nicaragua, Honduras, uh, Laos. And so they were taking the training with us, and we got to know those guys off and on. But uh, that was pretty much it. We were, and we're from all over, you know. Talked to different guys, got to know them. They were from Michigan and California, and some from Jersey, and some from Nebraska. They were, you know, it was a, a very homogeneous mix. Mm -hmm. uh, were most of the people training you people who had already been to Vietnam, and your company commander was, but uh, or yeah, you yeah. got well. For the NCOs, yes. Mm -hmm. For the officers, no. The, in fact, one of the training officers, one of the guys who was like uh, executive officers for the training companies, uh, was actually uh, somebody I saw in Vietnam later on. <laughs> but he was just a little bit ahead of us, so he had he already taken his training, so they kept him over to be executive officer, and then that was his stateside. And he ended up over in Nam um, the same time I did. But I see his. Later on, I said, oh, look, he was in charge of me. Hey, is that you? He said, oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> of course, he didn't remember me. You know, right. But, uh, okay. Now, with a, a course like that, do most of the people who start basic course, do they finish it? Or do they yeah, start? I would say you know, 95%. Uh, actually, if somebody didn't finish it, it might be because some, some physical ailment showed up. That, uh, and if it, if it was the point you couldn't finish the course, it wasn't, you know, invariably it was that you were going to be drummed out of the Army because you weren't physically fit. Um, I don't know of anybody who, I never heard of anybody who did not complete the course or quit the course. Uh, the option of quitting the course was to go, you know, 
to be drafted. So. <laughs> well, or or get, get, I know guys who did that and got straight to, went straight to Vietnam. So yeah. yeah, and we did have, and you had your orders when you got there, so you know where you were going next. And my orders were to go to Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, and the big issue, the big thing that I remember about this, I was there, you know, and they're paying me. You know, this, this is my first full time job. You know, I've had summer jobs, but now I got a full time job. I get a paycheck every month. This is really neat. And here they are, they're paying me temporary duty pay to be there for that nine weeks. So I get another $11 a day I'm there. It was like, oh man, all this money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so as we're getting close to graduation uh, for the unit, guys are saying, well, you know, they got other courses. You can sign up for ranger school. You can sign up for airborne. You can sign up for heavy mortar platoon leader school. And so I said, yeah. So I signed up for Airborne. I said, I'll jump out of airplane. I had no interest in doing that, but it's eleven dollars a day. <laughs> and three weeks of course, you know. And it's a lot a lot of running and uh, and again, it's nothing that you can't handle. Mm -hmm. uh, and so went through jump school, made my five jumps, got my wings, and I also then I, I tried to sign up for the heavy mortar platoon leader school. And my point of doing that was because I wanted to have more experience directing fire. And I thought, well, maybe there's a chance I'll be assigned to heavy mortars, and I know they're pretty far in the rear. But I, you know, I didn't expect that would happen, but I was more interested in getting the uh, experience firing. And, uh, but it turns out that's a five-week course, and it started every five weeks. Well, I, took a, I should have signed up for that first, then I could have signed up for airborne, because they started that every week. But I, you know, so I wasn't able to, and so I ended up going back down to Fort Polk. And I had actually considered ranger school for a bit, but that's a 10-week course. Most of the time you're away from home, and I had been married that long. I said, nah, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna, <laughs> so if I hadn't been married, I probably would have tried rangers. You know. Yeah, ideally, you string together enough schools that are, it's all over by the time you're done. But uh, <laughs> yeah, probably uh, going that way. Okay, so now you you got into Fort Polk. So, so I guess how long was the uh, course at, at Fort Benning? The three basic is the three months or it was nine weeks. Nine weeks. Okay, and so then you have like three more weeks for jump school. And uh, so I end up in Fort Polk around in the beginning of August. Okay, so this is not this is sixty nine. Yeah, yeah. sixty nine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, uh, Fort Polk, Louisiana, in August. So, what was that like? It was warm. <laughs> it was humid, and uh, it was con it was considered by the the people who are in the army on full, you know, for life or for their whole career. They considered going to Vietnam and going to Fort Polk as two hardship tours in a row. <laughs> That's how much they thought of Fort Polk. They didn't really care for it. Uh, so I heard all the scuttlebutt and. Uh, yeah, and when my wife and I drove down, to, we drove into Leesville, and it's not a place you want to take your wife through because she she's just you know she's just getting used to being in the service with you, and you go in there and it's nothing but at that time it was nothing but uh, strip joints and bars and pawn shops and sleazy motels and you know and she says well, oh we can't be living here you know get into went into the post. And they said, well, there was no on-post housing for junior officers, but they had, uh, there were trailer parks around. And we ended up renting a mobile home, which was much, much nicer. It turned out to be fine. And as I, so I get there and I'm talking to the other officers that I had met in uh, Officer Basic, and they, some of these guys were much more knowledgeable and in tune because you know, they had relatives in the Army, so they knew what was happening. They said, they'd already got the scuttlebutt. They said, oh, they said, yeah, the worst assignment out there is Tiger Ridge. It's 30 miles from post, and you know, they're in the woods all the time. And, and the, you know, so I heard this kind of about. And so we're sitting around, we're sitting, meeting the uh, the colonel, who's giving us our assignments. And one guy gets an assignment. And he's got a training company. And somebody else has got a machine gun range. And somebody else has a hand grenade range. And, Another guy has another training company, and he finally gets to the widget guy, which is always the end of the line. Yeah. And uh, he says, he couldn't say my name, but that's I didn't notice that anything special. If he said it right the first time, I would have been really surprised. 
and he says, essentially, he says, which guy? He says, ah, I see, see that uh, you have a degree in wildlife biology. So I'm going to send you where there's a lot of wildlife. I'm going to send you to Tiger Ridge. And I'm thinking, oh, good. So I, so I report to Tiger Ridge the next day. It turned out to be the best assignment I could have ever asked for. <laughs> I worked essentially uh, half a day on Wednesday, day and night, Thursday, Friday, and then turned the company back to their company commander on noon and Saturday. And then I, unless I had, was officer of the day, I was off until the following Wednesday. So it was like, I had all those downtime. So my wife and I, we'd go down to, drive down to Houston, we'd go to Mobile, go visit people, because I'd have three, four days off. Okay. Now what were you actually doing on Tiger Ridge? In Tiger Ridge, I worked with two NCOs who had been to Vietnam, and these were guys who had probably another three or four months to go when they got to out there, and they were not happy campers, uh, but they worked with me well. Uh, they had a bigger problem with the first sergeant, which is usually the case, because I, I wasn't going to give any mm -hmm. ration shit. I'm a new guy, but they're showing me this is what we do. This we, and we set up ambushes and uh, we set up booby traps, and then we run the troops through it, these things. We'd set them up in ambush, and then we'd have you know tell them how to set up a perimeter at night. And, and have them dig in foxholes and, you know, tell them to be quiet at night and that you're going to be, you may have situations where the NBA or the BC will be out hollering at you and trying to locate your position. And uh, so, you know, and that's what we did. And uh, we lived in tents for the time we were out there. But it was, you know, avoided the snakes and it was fine. Okay. So, and of course, you're on, on a ridge, so you're at least not down in the swamp. That's right. It was okay. nice high ground. Uh, pretty much. There was there was creeks and and then the first day I was out there, you know, I saw all the poisonous snakes in in North America except for the coral snake. I saw that a couple of weeks later. So <laughs> there's plenty of poisonous snakes. And I had when they told me, yeah, you gotta be watch out for the snakes and I'm thinking, Oh yeah, they told me that in Fort Benny. I couldn't find a poisonous mm -hmm. snake. And I traipsed through the woods and uh, out there. Um, <laughs> our biggest problem was the uh, recruits would catch these little pygmy rattlers. And then they'd milk them and keep them for pets. So you know they had the eight inch, ten inch rattlers. They would, and then they'd also catch scorpions and put them in their earplug containers and have them on their epaulets. They're going to take them back with them, you know. So we were having to check these guys all the time and have them to release the wildlife. But these are these are eighteen year old kids. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them first time in the wild, and other ones are wouldn't touch them. But you know, it's like oh boy, oh boy. Yeah. And what, what kind of attitude did you observe among the recruits? Because this is now 1969, and most yeah. a lot of mighty draftees. They seem to, they seem to be pretty basic. You know, uh, you know, they they didn't have a, they were they were yeah we got to do this. You know, they paid some of them paid close attention, others just did what they had to. Uh, but we never had any real problem with. The only problem we ever had was when we're doing. You know, trying to get them to give up their positions and on their perimeters, they'd start hollering at us sometimes. Then they'd throw rocks at us, and we'd holler back, "Quit throwing those rocks!" At them. Or we're going to throw a grenade simulator at her. Well, the grenade simulator, you don't hear it until it goes off. So you don't want to be too close to that. So we had one one time they we threw a grenade simulator, and fell in their foxhole. We hear these guys scrambling out of it, and the thing goes off. They didn't throw any more rocks at us, <laughs> but uh, you know that was it. But the the troops were basically they're pretty good, and the the NCOs I worked with uh, they had issues with the with the first sergeant, but uh, the two of them I got we got along well, and uh, we worked everything out. So, but we did all sorts of things like you know how to search a village, and uh, we never I never searched a village again, you know and detecting booby traps and we didn't have any booby traps out when we were in the jungle where we were at that time so you know the ambush was one thing that we did do but a lot of the stuff that we were doing there was just mm -hmm. it was it was geared for the southern part uh, and i corps was just uh, a different area yes okay and particularly once you get up into the hills if you're down more closer to the coast you're 
by running to more of, of the right. other kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, the area that you wound up was quite different. Yeah, and of course, Vietnam was just so different from one area to another. It's hard yeah. to plan for the whole thing. Yeah, and nobody, nobody realized that. I didn't realize it. And uh, even the Army, who should have realized it, uh, they geared their training for where most of the tra work had been. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the people who were going over at that time, a high percentage of them were going to be still in the lowlands in that area because they weren't going to the mountains. But we, you know, but then things were getting hot up in I Corps. So right. Okay. So uh, when do you finish the assignment at Fort Polk? Uh, we. I finished that in the beginning of early in February, and then I had a 30-day leave, and so my wife and I drove home. And uh, by this time, she's nine months pregnant, and so she had our daughter was born uh, on the 11th of March, and I was due to leave for jungle school on the 17th of March. So I got, and I assumed. And then my order said jungle school with, and then Vietnam. Uh, so I said goodbye to my wife and daughter and my parents and everybody. And took off, went down to uh, the canal zone where they had jungle training for two weeks. Finished jungle training, and then they then they said, "All right, you have six days to get from here to Fort Ord. Go ahead. We'll see you later." Mm -hmm. Well, I said six days. There was airplanes. I went home. <laughs> right. What, what was the jungle school like? Jungle school was, uh, you know, kind of neat. We did a, we did a little bit of ambushing, but mostly it was just a lot of walking through the jungle, getting hot and sticky, and and they were showing you plants that you could eat and you know what you had to avoid and uh, talking about ways that you could survive in the jungle if you should be, you know, cut off from rations and or and for the most part. Uh, most of us did not expect that would ever happen, and, and that's pretty much true. But uh, the Army wanted to make sure that the officers, and it was primarily officers that went through it, they did have some NCOs, but they wanted to make sure that the officers had some background. And I think the other thing is it gave you a, a, a little more chance to get used to the hot weather before you got there. So, you know, to me it was, a, I got to see tree sloths, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was, yeah. I was, I was having a good time identifying things. Right. So for a wildlife biologist, it's not yeah, a bad job. It was. Yeah. I was, I was having a good time. So far, the, the army was doing good for by me. <laughs> okay. So now you go. You go home again. You get out to Fort Ord, California. Um, yeah. Did you I, spend much time there? Or? I ended up being there for 12 hours. Uh, turns out, I got there before my flight left, but uh, it was due to leave in an hour. But they wouldn't let me board. They said, No, we've already we fit, went ahead and filled it. You'll have to wait. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, gee whiz, I'm sorry. And I said, they said, next flight will be out in 12 hours. So I, I stayed in the airport for 12 hours, got on the f following flight. And this flight flew from Fort Ord to Alaska, uh, and then from Alaska to Okinawa, and from Okinawa it went to Vietnam. And I was, if I had gotten the flight I was scheduled, I would have been on with a lot of the officers that I had trained with, because they were all due about the same time. But because I missed that flight, I ended up going with a lot of enlisted men. So, you know, I was one of the few officers, I think, on board, but it didn't matter, you know. Everybody, the guys are all having a good time, and they had a good time going to Alaska, and they had a good time going to Okinawa, and they had a good time as we were going to Vietnam. And we hit Vietnam coast just as we're getting to dusk. And you could, as we hit the, you know, flew over the ground, you look down now, and all of a sudden, you got craters everywhere. And we're going down to Thompson Airways, you know, and then you look down there and there's craters, 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 just, you know, all over the place. And at that point, everybody, the, the plane really got quiet, you know, and just, everybody shut up. Because they're all looking and it's like, oh, shit, <laughs> you are here now. The fun is over. And, that's, and then we got off the plane. Well, you've been on this plane for 14 hours. You step out and it's just like a wall of humidity, just okay. And then they hustle us off into a, a bus, and uh, I don't believe it was air conditioned, it probably wasn't. And uh, we got on there, and uh, we got the chain link fence over the windows, 
and one guy, as we're getting on there, one guy says, is that to keep us in? I said, no, that's to keep the grenades out. Oh. <laughs> so it was, for, and by this time it's dark, you know, and then they drove us by bus over to the barracks, and uh, and then I, that's when I, and the next day, I found, uh, I located some of the guys that I had been training with, and, and I found my orders up on the board. And they said, "Yeah, your orders up there." And that's when I found out I was going to be a platoon leader for Alpha Company 2506, 101st. I mean, you know, for me that was fine. Mm -hmm. And I talked to one of the guys, Bob McMinn, and then he, I said, "Where are you? Where are you going, Bob?" Oh, "I'm going to 101st. I'll be up at uh, Camp Evans." I said, oh, "Me too." I said, "What are you? What are you going to do?" He says, "I'll be PX officer." I said, PX officer? I said, you're infantry. He said, PX officer? I said, wow. Now, I did not know that they were given us six months in the field, six months in the rear. Mm -hmm. I had no knowledge of that. Other guys, some guys knew it, but, you know, it wasn't, it was never discussed when I, you know, my circle. So I just figured, well, I'd be an infantry officer for a year. And I couldn't believe that he's going to be a PX officer for a year. The, now, you know, when you're, uh, when you got there, did they sort of ask you anything like, well, well gee, which unit do you want to go to, or are they just telling you? No, there was no asking. They just they had it up on the board, here you go. And did you have any sense of what the difference was between one unit and another at that point? No. It, to me, it was just 101st, that sounds good, I've heard of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Infantry platoon leader, okay, I knew that was what I was going to do. So to me, it was like, okay, you know, they, they gave me an assignment. All right. Uh, now they, how do they get you up to Camp Evans? Uh, from there, seems to me we prop. I think we took. A, I want to say we took a C-130 to Da Nang. I believe that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And then we picked a Chinook up from there, and that took us up to either Camp Eagle or Evans, and I don't recall now. And if it was Camp Eagle, then they would have dropped, taken us. To, and I think it was Evans because I think we got two Evans in the, in the Chinook. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, that was my first experience with the Chinook, and I didn't like it, and I never did like it from then on. It was very noisy, vibrated like crazy, and if you were on the ground, it threw dust and sand all over you. And, you know, just it really tough machine to be near. But uh, I got there, and then they enrolled us in the CERTs, which is a Screaming Eagle uh, replacement training. Yeah, and uh, so that's. We did that for the next two weeks, and that was interesting. And and the purpose of that, they told us, was to give you a chance to get used to the weather before they sent you out to the bush. Okay. And, uh, now, physically, does your body have to adjust to all of this? Um, yeah, I think for a lot of people, it depends on what you do for in your regular life. I mean, I worked on the marshes of New Jersey, you know, 100 degree weather, and the humidity there is more than hot. Uh, so it's most of us to me it was like, oh yeah, it's hot, it's humid. Mm -hmm. it, I psychologically nothing that didn't bother me. I'd also worked in a situation with, in New Jersey where we had lots of mosquitoes and other insects, and so some guys talk about the mosquitoes in Vietnam, and they were just sort of background to me. And you know, and that's just it's because of what you're used to. And uh, so I I think you know I adjusted fairly quickly. What took longer to adjust to was the weight of the rucksack. <laughs> but, uh, you know, for the training there, I, I paid attention and then uh, and from there they said, okay, go, you know, tomorrow go meet your battalion commander. So what's sort of the, the normal pack to carry? Is it weight of the rucksack? So what's going to be in that? Well, rucksack that I normally carried, I had on me, it was not only the rucksack, but I also had the web gear. And I would carry a minimum of six hand grenades, Use a minimum of six uh, smoke grenades. Then I would have uh, 400 rounds of M16 ammo. I did not carry a pistol. Uh, I had no desire to have a 45. I wanted to have, I had decided I wanted an M16 because it made no sense for me to carry ammo that somebody else couldn't use if I got shot. So, and I wanted to be able to shoot if I had to. And I knew technically I wasn't supposed to have to shoot. Things are going well. Mm -hmm. Not too much anyway. But uh, <laughs> and then also we all carried a pound of C4. Uh, we carried three days worth of rations, and that's those are you know that's all canned rations. So you're looking at a couple pounds for each day. Well, a couple pounds for each meal. Mm -hmm. 
and then you'd carry a gallon and a half, two gallons of water, and uh, you carried an entrenching tool, a bayonet, you carried a, uh, you'd have a, a terry towel for wiping off the sweat, you had your hard helmet, you had uh, your poncho, your poncho liner, uh, you carried 600, uh, 100 rounds of M60 ammunition for the machine gun, everybody carried that. I carried a strobe light. I carried, uh, I ended up carrying blasting caps because nobody else wanted to carry them. And I, you know, you know, I, I don't blame them. I knew what they could do, but it, somebody got carrying so I put them in my ruck and hoped they didn't blow up too fast. So did you ever add up with all that weight? No, I, but, you know, I was told it was, it, it varied between sometime during the day between 60 and 90 pounds during that period from when you first pick it up. And you learn to, all right, what don't I need? I don't need this, I don't need that. But I also carried a, 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 a M60 ammo box, which is about uh, probably three feet, three inches and by 12 inches and about eight inches high. And that's waterproof. And that's where I kept my writing utensils. And if I had a magazine or a book, I'd keep that there. And I always had books and magazines, so you know, and pictures from home, and, you know. Mm -hmm. So when you start adding all this stuff up, it's big. But you know, it's what you want. Now the guys, some guys are very specific. They're oh, I'm not going to carry that. I'm not going to carry that. And you also had a Claymore mine that was another pound and a half. You know. So you know, and it, and you have trip, you have trip flares. You start thinking about it. It, mm -hmm. it keeps going up as to what you had. And uh, it was easily the first day, first time you get it all together. Just you got back on the ground. Get down there, you put it on your shoulders, and you go to stand up and you can't get up. <laughs> so we always had somebody there to give you a hand and then get you up. Once you're up, you're good. But after after you had get, after a while you'd learn to make sure you had that on the uphill side, you'd be on the downhill side and you could get up. But you know, trying to get in your pack and get up on the flat, you had to have somebody give you a hand in most cases. Okay. So that's something they didn't do at Fort Benning or any place else. No, no, not on that no, level. we never carried rucksacks like that. Okay, uh, now you go out, um, now did you join your unit in the field or were they in the camp or? I, yeah, I, well, after I got done with certs, I met uh, Colonel Lucas and you know, he welcomed me to the organization and everything and said, you know, your, dry, your guys are out in the field right now. He said, um, go down to your see the first sergeant down there at Alpha Company and uh, he'll make arrangements to get you out in the field. And so I met with Sergeant Ross and then said, uh, so, oh, here, go see supply, they'll get you your rucksack. And stuff. So they loaded me up, all sorts of good stuff. And then the next morning uh, I went to the chopper pad and, and I got on the chopper pad with the mail and flew out there. It's about a 20 minute flight. And uh, so I'm looking down and I see, you know, we're flying around, there's this opening, and I see some smoke there. I don't see anybody down there, you know. Just the smoke coming up, you know, purple smoke. And then they come down, and then the door owner says, all right, get out, and, and jump out. And, uh, you know, for my training, I said, okay, I gotta get away from the helicopter as fast as I can, because if they get shot down, it becomes a danger. So you get out, and you run away. And so I'm running off into the bushes, and, I don't see anybody, you know. It's like I hope somebody's here, you know. <laughs> I just, but I'm just doing what I was trained. I run off in the bushes, and then somebody says, "LT over here," and then a radio man who was uh, would called in the chopper, and then somebody else came out and got the stuff that was on the, the other stuff that was on the helicopter, and then he led me back to where the company was. Now, when was this that you got out there? Turns out it was uh, about the 30th of uh, April. Okay. So you're all, by this time, the battalion, they, they have set up the base on, on Ripcord, yep. uh, which we'll talk about in, in a moment. And so you're out there in the hills and the jungle and so forth, the highlands, so you're not down in the lowland area at all. Uh, who was the company commander at the time you joined? Uh, my company commander was uh, Albert Burkhart. And uh, he had been company commander since January. And he eventually, he left the company the end of May and moved on to another job. but. Uh, I met him and uh, uh, Captain or Lieutenant Wilcox at that time. Uh, Jeff Wilcox was there. He was uh, first platoon leader, and second platoon leader, which I was taking over, was 
Gary Kelly was there. And he he was still there, and he's going to show me around for a couple of days. And third platoon was uh, headed up by Jim Knoll, and we just had three platoons, and that was it. And then the uh, there were also the Ford Observer uh, EFO, and he was uh, that was uh, uh, Lieutenant Brennan, and he was a, he was West Point, and so was uh, uh, Wilcox. Mm -hmm. Everybody else was either OCS or I think the other two officers were OCS, and. Uh, and that's and I got to meet all of them and uh, you know and that's where we we operated out there for the next uh, couple I guess next week or so we operated in that AO and uh, there really wasn't much going on of significance other than the one thing I remember is hearing that first platoon or first yeah first platoon had flushed a pheasant out there. And, off of a nest, and they were checking the eggs to see if they were edible. <laughs> but they were talking about this long-tailed pheasant. So, uh, now, about how many men were in your platoon when you got there? I don't remember right offhand, but invariably it was probably no more than 25. Uh, the most I ever recall having in my platoon, I think, uh, was in after ripcord. And I remember I wrote to my wife and I mentioned that we had 29 people. It's the most I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So, and and there were maybe more people assigned. There were probably more people assigned to me. But what happens is people are going in for medical reasons. They're going in for R and R. They derose. They come back and forth. So you just you never you never have a whole lot of guys in the field with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, shortly after I got there, one of my NCOs came back like, about three days later. On the next time we got resupplied, he comes in. The field, so I met him, and he just came came off of uh, of uh, R and R. So he spent a lot of time just telling everybody how great R and R was, and how good time he had. And this great girl he met in Thailand, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then after everything was over, and you know everybody else, I said, "All right, guys, break it up. Get yeah, back to back to playing army here. Get back out." And then he came to me. He says, uh, "Oh, LT he says uh, I got to go in the next next chopper here. I got to go back in." I said, "Why?" Well, he says. Uh, I got the clap and I got to get some shots. <laughs> well, okay. okay, good time has its price. Now, how did you approach taking over a, a platoon? How did you deal with the men and so forth? Basically, I, I, I dealt strictly with my uh, platoon sergeant. I, de I depended on the platoon sergeant. And it was recommended by most people, you know, pay attention to your platoon, to platoon sergeant. If he's got any experience, he probably knows more. And I. My platoon sergeant was uh, Dennis Leverett, and uh, he basically made sure I didn't do anything dumb right away. After a while, I did, you know, I do dumb things on my own, but you know, and that's and that's pretty much their job. They they are they know all the platoon, the squads, the squad mm -hmm. leaders, and so I learned from him, and uh, and that's pretty much how things worked out. Okay, and you'd also have other people. Usually with you'd have like a, at least a, a radio operator. Yeah, I had a, my radio operator at that time was a guy by the name of uh, Michaels. I think it's uh, Thomas Michaels, and uh, so you know I deal with him on a regular basis. And but in most time, my dealings are with the company commander and my platoon sergeant. And I would talk to the squad leaders on occasion, but more than likely, you know. Platoon sergeant and I would talk about what the company commander wanted us to do the next day, and he would designate, all right, you know, first squad you're gonna, you'll be the lead squad. And if there was any problems, then I, he would come to me and say, okay, I got a problem here, mm -hmm. and then that I would handle it. But it wasn't, you know, normally the guys all, they knew what they had to do. Okay. Now in the first weeks when you're out there, uh, you said there wasn't much going on, so you were just patrolling? Yes, it was just doing uh, uh, riffs, you know, Recon and force, uh, checking the area. We move our location a little bit. Uh, I don't, I don't recall that we moved very much, but apparently we went back and forth on this one hill. We'd be off of it, and then we'd come back a day or two later. And uh, and it was, and I think there. I don't know that we have. We may have had some contact, but I don't. It's not my platoon. Okay. So the enemy is not really very visible. Did the platoons operate separately? Yes. In most cases, with our company. And I think with most of the companies around Ripcord, 
platoons operated three, four hundred yards apart, uh, or meters, and, as we talked in those days, but you'd be that far apart. And uh, so that's what we'd be doing, and uh, we just wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't see, I'd see the company commander use it because I was the new, new guy, he usually kept his CP with, with my outfit. Mm -hmm. And it, that makes sense, he wants to make sure that you're doing things right. Yeah, it doesn't want, don't want you to go off on a tangent yet, you know. I'll let you do that later. So, but so there was usually the CP was with one platoon, and then the other two platoons worked elsewhere. And then once in a while, we'd join up with another platoon for a while. And, but there was always a, it seems like we almost never were we all together except for resupply. Okay. And even at resupply, it would be one, maybe two platoons there, and then they would leave, and then the third platoon would come in and get resupplied. You know, we'd have all the stuff there, but. The other ones would provide security, or you know, okay. and this is resupply from helicopters or bringing helicopters. things into LZs yeah. in the jungle. Yeah, and the helicopter. Uh, anybody who was in the army in those days, when you get out of the army, the Huey helicopter would just, yeah, it would shake you uh, because, and I, I've, I've analyzed it in my mind that because, yeah, I mean, 20 years later, I'd hear a Huey flying over, and I'd be looking up, you know. And I know it's a Huey. I can tell by the sound, but I got to look up and see the Huey. And uh, now they don't fly them very much. Most of them are uh, grounded. You know, the National Guard doesn't have many. They've gone over to Blackhawks, which have a completely different sound. And uh, but you had this. It get this funny feeling, in it, and it was sort of it was a feeling of anticipation and, and also a little bit of dread. And the reason was because the helicopter was. That was your lifeline to the rear, and it brought out your food, it brought out the water, it brought out ammo, it brought out mail, it was just, just the best thing in the world that you could get out there. But when you came in, when it came in, the enemy knew where you were exactly. So you might get mortared now, or you might get attacked, so it was like, it was a two-edged sword. It, it was really good to see him, but it was like, oh man. And they also, you know, they medevaced you if you got people injured. So even when you had a medevac, you knew you needed them here, but you hated the fact that they had to come because now the enemy knew for sure just your location. So it was that kind of a feel, it was a love-hate relationship for a long time. And like I said, 20, even 30 years later, I still had that feeling. And then uh, a few years ago down in Fort Worth, we had a, heli a Huey, one of the guys owned one, and he brought it to the reunion. It was like... Oh, <laughs> <laughs> still don't like this out. Okay. Okay. Now, what was the battalion's mission at this point in time? This is like May of 1970. Now, what are they doing? What is Ripcord for an outside audience? Well, Ripcord by this point was was a fully established uh, fire base, and the the purpose of setting up the fire base is to provide uh, firepower in the form of artillery to the army units, the infantry units around it, and also they were able to fire over into the Ashall Valley. With the 155s, and uh, and I don't know, but I suspect that the whole plan was to set up these bases, and they were probably going to make a foray into the Ashall to uh, get rid of some of the supplies that the NBA had been stocking over there. The whole purpose is to provide more security for the Arvind, who are going to be taking over because we were now uh, winding down. Mm -hmm. So if we can reduce the amount of supplies that the uh, NBA have available to them then uh, the Arvin will have more breathing room. And uh, so, you know, we had, uh, O'Reilly was just up the, just up a little north of us, and I don't know if they had plans to open another fire base or not, but this, it, that, we got the impression this was what the colonel had in mind. Mm -hmm. it, it's not like he said, oh, here's what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, somebody knew, but uh, I was a lieutenant. And right. So in hindsight, you got to do with research or talk to higher ups and realize, yes, this was supposed to be a jumping off point to actually launch the Arvin First Division into the Ashraf Valley, and which was a main kind of supply route as well as storage area to get from Laos and the Ho Chi Minh Trail into the lowland areas around Da Nang, where there was that was sort of a big target area for the enemy. It said it was mess up, mess them up, mess up their plans, their supplies, uh, and okay, and then initially at least, that seems to be working. You're there, they're not putting up much of a fight. Right. When you were patrolling, did you start to find enemy supplies or indications of their presence? 
they they found some before I got there in uh, in April and found a couple caches in in the area, and uh, that was over near uh, probably Hill 600, 605, I think, or somewhere in that area. So they were finding some, but when I would during May we weren't finding anything, and then they finally decided by the middle of May they said, okay, rent combat assault you guys to a new location, and so. Uh, I think it was the 13th of May, they picked us all up and flew us into a new site. And uh, there was, they, it was reported that it was a hot LZ. Uh, they didn't fire when I was there, but it fired up some, you know, maybe the first chopper in, but nothing got, no, nobody got hurt. And then from there, the next day we moved out. And uh, then the uh, first platoon led and the point man was killed. Uh, Bob Lowe was killed, and a couple other guys wounded. Uh, Wilcox was wounded, ended up having to go back to the rear. And uh, and we found a bunker, a couple of bunkers there. We didn't get any of the NVA, they just dropped off the side, which often was the case. And uh, that was the first real contact that we had. And, uh, and I was told to you know, get my platoon up there and destroy the bunker. And uh, you can't see it. <laughs> By the time I got there, the NVA had left. Of course, we weren't sure. And uh, I remember we had, I had a light anti-tank weapon, the law, which is a collapsible bazooka set thing. And I took that and uh, I fired it at the, what I thought was the, uh, the bunker. And it turned out it was. And, uh, and I, you know, I look at it now. If there's anybody there, I was dead, you know. But there was nobody there, so it worked out fine. <laughs> But, uh, and that's what we did. And then uh, the next day or so, we moved out. And again, we were moving in, uh, pl patrolling in uh, uh, platoon units. And the company commander was with my platoon. And I think uh, about, I think it was on the 20th, uh, and we ran into a trail watcher. And he allowed five people to pass him, and we didn't see him. He might have been hiding behind a tree or something. Finally, the I'm the fifth guy, I get past him, and there's wall of bamboo and then my radio man's come behind me and the guy steps out, fires up, killed, uh, wounds my radio man, hits him in the buttocks, got him a million dollar wound, you know, he got to go home. And uh, the guy behind him was startled and didn't fire, and, and but the but it was real steep and then, you know, so we're on this part of the trail and it's like this and the guy's over here. And as soon as he fired, he just dropped right down the side of the hill. We fired and of course, it was all over his head, and, and uh, we never got anybody. And then uh, we called in an evacuation and medevaced our my radio man out. We got to assign somebody else to carry the radio. Mm -hmm. Carrying radio was not necessarily a good job. It, you didn't get to have to, you didn't have to walk point, but it was a target almost all the time. And if you were in front of or behind the radio, you were also a target usually because that meant you were a person of authority. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know if you were in front or behind it. So, but the guy behind the radio in this case had an M79 grenade launcher. So I think the, they didn't look like the guy in the shoot. So they shot the radio man. Yeah. What well, would they be able to spot the radio or tell the difference between that and a regular? Yeah, it, yeah. it was a big boxy contraption like that. And it had the antenna up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you had that on your back. It's and you had the headset sitting here. That's your you know strapped onto your rucksack. So yeah, it's. Pretty obvious. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, see, do things kind of does the tempo kind of pick up a little bit? You get into late May, into June, you get yeah, more it, contact. It was it was picking up at this point because some of the other units were pick you know running into things. And, and before we hit that trail watcher, we actually had seen a footprint in the trail. So now we're starting to and it was a fresh naked footprint. So I was like, okay, something's going on here. Now you understand that. The area we were in, there were no villages. There was, and there were no uh, civilians. Uh, everybody we saw, they were NVA. They had uniforms on. They had pith helmets and khaki shorts and shirts. So you didn't have. It was more like World War II in that respect. You didn't have to worry about. Are you going to shoot the wrong guy? Well, yeah, you did worry, but you know, it was less of a worry. It wasn't like well, this guy come get me later when he mm -hmm. takes his pajamas off and puts his helmet on. You know. So that was kind of good. And so if we saw any sign of people 
we knew it was the NDA. And, uh, but we didn't see, we went through the rest of that month. I didn't see anything. We did find a 50 caliber, uh, 51 caliber location where they had been, they had set up to fire the 51. We found some more bunkers that we destroyed. So we were finding things like that. Uh, we didn't encounter any more people that I, I think my platoon did. I don't recall the others encountering anybody. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, and you know, significantly what I remember about that period of time is when things were quiet, it was just really nice. You know, I, you know, I was I was the uh, biologist again, mm -hmm. and uh, and when the when my troops found out I had a degree in biology, they were bringing me stuff all the time, <laughs> identifying. I said, I said, well, maybe I could help you. I said, but I didn't study jungle biology, <laughs> but I you know I did identify some of the things that they brought me, and and we always we had centipedes and millipedes, and they were poisonous, and you know, but they were beautiful, and just all sorts of colors on them. But you didn't want to get bit because mm -hmm. you had a reaction that wasn't nice, or you might. And of course, we always had leeches and you had earthworms that were a foot and a half long, and they'd come out at night and crawl over your hand and scare you to death. Uh, I saw one snake the whole time I was in the jungle, and I only saw four feet of it. I didn't mm -hmm. see the head. So. All right. And at this point, what's the mood of the men in, in your uh, unit, morale level? It seems pretty good. I mean, they're, you know. They like. They, I would say that at this point they, they they're comfortable with the captain. Uh, they're not sure about me. Uh, I've only been there a couple weeks. You know, they're. You know, they never trust the the new LTs. You know, you have, you have to really do something to. And so far, I hadn't done anything special, and uh, or you know, yeah, I don't know about this guy. And that, but the platoon sergeant kept him in line, and you know. Kept him. Oh, don't worry, he'd be all right. And in the meantime, you didn't do anything stupid. Yeah, and that's <laughs> all right. Now this tape is about. Okay, so we've gotten you kind of pretty much through about May of 1970 here, uh, and into maybe into early June. You say that you're encountering more and more things are going on now. Um, there's also at a certain point a, a command change in your company. And yeah. how does that come about? Well, after we finished going through that area after my my uh, radio man got shot. Uh, about two weeks after that, we end up on we end up on a hill for resupply, and uh, Colonel Lucas sent out uh, a Captain Hawkins to take over the company. And was he a captain at that point? He was captain. He, they they promoted him early because mm -hmm. his promotion date was supposed to be like the sixth of June, but they uh, the colonel wanted him to be take over the company. And part of this, you know, we suspected that he was another West Pointer like uh, Lucas. So, that, but the, the two of them got along very well, and uh, he had been doing apparently fine when he was working as a lieutenant with the Charlie Company, and got to know Lucas, I think, in that period of time. And I'm sure that uh, Captain Hawkins probably was looking to get. A, I know he wanted to get a company, and he probably just you know, sooner the better. Uh, what we heard later was that, uh, you know, the colonel thought that uh, that uh, Burkhart was not aggressive enough, and I could understand. I didn't feel that he was aggressive. I we had a good time. We were enjoying the war as much as we can enjoy it. But we were, you know, we were doing what we were told. And uh, but that took place like uh, I think that was the 31st of of May, and then. We were still at work, and we worked around that AO for another day. Burkhart left, and then on the second, we picked up and flew out. And now there's, this is a period that I, it's somewhat confusing. I have a memory of what happened on that period, but then I've looked at the, the official log, and it, they have us way someplace else, and I have to talk to more people, but as far as I can re remember, I, have, I was only on ripcord one day, maybe two, but in my memory, after we got the new captain, they picked us up, and they were gonna, the assumption was, and that's what I remember, is we were going to have, we were doing a CA, a combat assault, so they were going to pick up and we were going to go someplace else, and, uh, and that's the way it always worked. 
And, you know, that's my memory as an, an officer. And I don't think they would have said, oh, we're going to go to Ripcord if we were going, unless we were going there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we get up in the air. And then instead of flying directly over to where we normally go, we're making this big leisurely circle up around two or 3,000 feet up. And I think what was happening, and I've never had a chance to ask uh, Hawkins about it, is I think they were getting a change of orders. And I think at that point, uh, Hawkins and, uh, and Black Spade were talking about where they want, wanted us, and Black Spade did not. I, I think what Black Spade says, I'm going to need you down here. And so we made this big circle. And I, I remember that day very well because I'm sitting on the outside of it, on the edge of the helicopter, you know, and you, you have your legs hanging over the side so you can get out fast. And, um, well, they're make, you know, making this big turn. Well, we're not going very fast, so the centripetal force is not there. And I'm starting to slide off. Of <laughs> My butt's sliding. I'm heading out. Well, I, can't, I got nothing to grab onto. You know, and I looked look to my radio man, I said, grab my ruck. And he just, all he had to do was hold it, and then it stopped me. But I was already thinking about whether or not I could grab that uh, strut as I fell past it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and if I didn't, it was, it was over. But that was, because I remember that really well. And then we find, they decided where they're going, and we landed on ripcord. We got on ripcord, and then they said, they were told, all right, you guys are going to take over the, uh, security for Ripcord and Delta, for, I think Delta Company was there at the time, and they'll be going out into the field. Okay, we had not, we had not done security for Ripcord yet, mm -hmm. so, and usually they would rotate companies. So that's what I assumed we were doing, and because we were going to be there for a while, the, back at the rear, they sent out a PX Connex, which is a big metal box with doors on it, uh, you know, it's about 10 feet long and eight feet high and eight feet wide and they had it filled with junk food from the px and you could buy it from the px and they had sodas and pretzels and chips and peanuts and all this stuff that stuff that you would like to buy but you you know you don't get to back to the px because all we you know it was a change of pace mm -hmm. and we were going to be here on the fire base for the next you know usually it's a month so hell you know yeah we'll do this so everybody goes to the they buy all sorts of Cokes and sodas and different things and takes it back to their bunkers and they're eating the stuff and uh, we're fixing up the, uh, you know, the wire and everything, getting ready to take over full time. And then sometime in the late afternoon, uh, the word comes down that, oh, change of orders. You guys are walking the Hill 1000 tomorrow. Well, heck, we got all this stuff. We're not going to carry this stuff with us. You know, you don't carry sodas in the field. You might carry, some guys might carry one, but it te it's terrible. It doesn't quench your thirst. It just makes you thirstier. And you don't carry pretzels and chips because you don't have room for them. And they, they're too noisy, you know what I'm <laughs> So, and then they said, uh, the fire base going on 50% alert tonight because they had a, apparently they had something from the uh, intelligence that said the NBA were planning an attack on the fire base. Of course, they didn't know which one. But they thought it might be ripcord, so we have this, uh, you know, alert. Well, when you have a 50% alert, you don't get, you know, you're up for two hours, you sleep for two hours. Well, that doesn't work very well, and so you end up with not much sleep at all. And uh, so it's been, it's almost sort of a party. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, one of the guys in my platoon, and I thought it was uh, Tommy Swain, but he said he didn't remember it. But one of the guys in my platoon had a transistor radio and he was tuned into the uh, Armed Forces uh, radio station and they were playing rock music at the time. Now, technically you're not supposed to have that in the field, but we don't check too close. But you're on a bunker line, nobody cares. And uh, But we also had, every unit had what we called Mickey Mouse radios. These were, these were intra-platoon headsets. So you had communications within the platoon that wouldn't go over the overnet. It was all line of sight. It worked very decently on the fire bases. It was worth nothing in the jungle. I mean, guy be 10 feet away. If there's a tree, at, you don't hear, you can't hear him. So anyway, Tommy's on the, listening to the radio. So he tunes the radio into the, when the song starts, puts it onto his 
Mickey Mouse radio, and he broadcast it to the rest of the guys, whoever would hear it. <coughs> and then, when the song was over, he would then DJ the record and say, okay, that was so-and-so by Rolling Stones. And, and then he would say, and if anybody wants free chips or soda, come on down to Bunker 37. We're open all night. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was, and that was the kind of thing that we were doing. Well, that was, so that's where we ended, so we were there on the second. And then the next morning we moved out. And, uh, and then we walked over to, walked over to Hill 1000. And that's when we ran into the NBA. And uh, had two guys at the, my point, it was uh, John Conrad and uh, the other fellow, Little. And uh, we hit the, they ran, they ran into some NBA sitting there in the trail eating. And John fired his gun, that's point man, and then I don't, I think it jammed or whatever, he just fired one shot. His point, the guy who was his, his slack man is supposed to file up. Well, turns out Little was deathly afraid of the whole thing. And he just couldn't, I mean, he bailed out. And so when when John didn't get any backup, he bailed. So then we pull back. We call in some call in airstrikes in the area, try to you know clean them up. And what they did was they came closer to us. And of course we couldn't tell. And so we had to go back in there. And my point team wouldn't go back in because they almost never do when they run into something that doesn't doesn't work out. So I told the squad leader to get another point team, and uh, he ended up getting. Uh, Waylon Norris came up and said, you know, I'll, I'll do point. And so he got point, and then the platoon, or the squad, the squad leader is uh, uh, Orville Kroger, Marvell Kroger. Anyway, or the, the Cooser, it's Cooser. Cooser, I think it is, I can't keep it. Anyway. Yeah, one of the, he, he takes the slack position. And so we start back out. We didn't get we just barely, I uh, might have moved 10 yards or so, and then from the back, uh, Nolan's, or uh, Norris's uh, squad leader comes, you know, hustling past me. And I remember grabbing him by the arm. I said, where are you going? He says, I got to get Norris off a point. And so I let him go, and, and he walked past me, went in and goes past the assistant gunner, the machine gunner, gets, gets up to... Uh, uh, Hooser, mm -hmm. and then Hooser turns around to see what's going on. About the same time, uh, Norris says to him, I, I, hear, I think I hear something, which is not the proper response. The proper response is shoot. Mm -hmm. And with that, the NVA fired. They hit Norris, killed him outright. And the second guy was aiming at uh, Hooser and hit him in the shoulder because he had turned and ended up with a, sh a shoulder wound instead of probably a heart wound. And then another bullet uh, went through his cheek and that hit right on, grazed the chin of uh, Wagner who was coming up there. And then all hell breaks loose and then we end up going online, we push him off, we never, they had, they fired and they left. But we now, did Norris have experience at point or why was the sergeant going after him? He'd only been with us for about a month or so, and I, the sergeant didn't, he didn't want him on point at this point in his career. <coughs> and when he found out that he had volunteered, mm -hmm. and you know, I didn't know, but, you know, these guys take care of the stuff, and uh, and so that, and I think he had, almost had a premonition, but once he heard that Norris was up there, he wanted to get him off, and it was just too, it was too late, mm -hmm. and um, and so we lost that guy, and then we, and then we had. Uh, we had the Cobras come back in later on, and uh, one of my guys, McVeigh, he got some wounds, some minor fr fragments from that, so we met back him out. And then uh, the next day, I, I think we met back, we took Norris's body out, and then the next day, or a couple days later, uh, first platoon ran into somebody, and a, guys, a couple guys were killed in that. And uh, I don't really remember it much, that I was told about that later. Mm -hmm. It wasn't my platoon, so that was, that was, that's what I remember. And then, by that time, it comes around to the 9th of June. And 
were having a stand down by the battalion. The battalion would have a stand down when they would get everybody into the rear, give them a break, refit, and then they also do some retraining. Take you out to the range, sight your guns in again, you know, practice ambushes just in case you forgot. And uh, and it's a, you know it's a chance in the rear. Guys get to clean up, you get to actually take a shower, get a hot meal that you can cook under over C4, stuff like that. And uh, so we went in on the 9th, and we were there till. And on the 15th, we came back out. And we also went down. I think guys say we went down to Eagle Beach. I did not go to Eagle Beach as far as I can remember. Uh, I think I would have recalled that. Mm -hmm. I suspect that they had me. I know I gave some classes when they came back, so I was probably preparing for the class. Uh, typical of what the officers often did, and, uh, and that's you know. And then we went back out in the jungle on the 15th of of uh, June, and we were out. The, and I got up that morning to go out in the jungle. Felt like I had uh, bruised my arm. Uh, you know, my elbow was sore. I must have hit it in the dark or something. You know, the, no big deal. Go out in the jungle, they drop us off. By noontime, my elbow had swelled way up. You know, and I and it was tender just just having the cloth just hurt. And I couldn't move it. And the only way to get my rucksack off was use a quick release. You know. <coughs> so I went to the medic and I said, Yeah, what is this? And he looked at it and he said, Oh, it looks like cellulitis. He said, Let me give you some penicillin. Cellulitis is just a bacterial infection. It comes when you get cuts and scratches. Yes. You can get it here in the States. Uh, and I got it over there. And uh, so, and then uh, that night, uh, I actually had nightmares. I was running a fever, and it got bigger yet, you know. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, they, were, they said, well, they had changed, again, new orders. Now we're going to go secure uh, Firebase O'Reilly. And the Arvins had been securing it. It was their artillery unit up there, but they had their own infantry around it. But now their infantry is going out in the field, and so we were being sent there to secure O'Reilly. So we got choppers came in, and I told the captain, I said, I'm, I've got to go back to the base hospital. So I'm going, they, had, they want me to take this look at. So I ended up going into uh, Camp Evans, and you know, well, I walk on into the into the medics building there. They said, what's your problem? I told them, said, oh yeah, cellulitis. They said, hmm. And they said, here. They said, they stick an IV in me with uh, a liter of uh, glucose and penicillin. And then, here, take this and walk out this door, hang a left, you'll find the barracks, go find a bed. <laughs> and you should have a rack there hanging this up. And so uh, that's what I did. And then uh, every so often they'd come in to check the drip and. I went through four liters of penicillin and glucose in, in about three days, and then the swelling went down. They said, yeah, if the swelling doesn't come down after a while, we're going to have to lance it. And it really hurt, so I wasn't really keen on that, that lancing it. But uh, then it recovered. And while I was there, I'm, I'm talking to the sergeant who was in there for the same thing. And he said, this is my second time in here. And he says, they will not send me back out in the field again. because." The antibiotics they had for it at that time, it was penicillin and tetracycline. And if if you had the penicillin, then they would give the tetracycline, but if they didn't want you to get it again because the penicillin probably was not going to be as effective the second time around. Mm -hmm. So they, if you got it the second time, they pulled you from the field because you had to keep clean. And that's what happened to this guy. He would already been there. And I didn't. I didn't want a second round in particular, so, so I, I, you know, a week later I'm back on O'Reilly with, with our guys, and that, uh, and about that time my platoon sergeant, who had been, you know, dealing with it all the time, he de -roast, he left, you know, he was going back to the States, and uh, so I had to select a new platoon sergeant, and I, I selected uh, Johnny Brown, and he was a, just an E5 staff uh, buck sergeant, mm -hmm. but and I don't remember the details, but he was the one I felt was going to be the best for the job. I had Wagner, and for some reason I did not pick him. And again, I don't know why. I, I don't remember. Uh, but I picked uh, uh, John Brown, and so 
And during that period of time, I had two black guys, uh, Conrad and Little. And uh, Little didn't like me. He thought I was prejudiced because I made him work like some of the other guys. And uh, I think he felt, he may also have felt bad. But they said, we'd like to be transferred to 3rd Platoon. They have a black platoon sergeant. We think everything would be better. I said, that's oh, fine. I got no problem. I said, if you have a problem, I said, I would have taken care of it. He said, no, 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 we just we want to be there. I said, okay. So I contacted 3rd Platoon Sergeant, and I said, do you want these guys? He said, oh, yeah. So he took them. And, uh, and I talked to him some weeks later. He said, you didn't do me any favor with the one guy, did you? <laughs> I said, well, I didn't say it was a favor. I said, I said, one of them. I said, and, and this, this guy, uh, Little, he was just, he was, there's no doubt in my mind, he, never, he didn't belong in the field. He had a real problem with, he was afraid. And that's, and that's understandable. I, you know, some people can control their fear, others, you know, but whenever things happened, he would get away, as far away from the shooting as he could. And I understand that, uh, you know, I wanted to, but I didn't, you know, because I did you know, my job came first. But, and some people just can't do that. It, it's not, I, I never felt that he was bad. He just couldn't handle it, and that, that happens. So, and eventually they got him out of the field, but he had, he had to get wounded to get out of the field. So. <laughs> All right. Now, it, uh, having Hawkins come in as company commander, it kind of changed the way you operated? It didn't to a great degree. Uh, we were still operating as single units, single platoons. Uh, he was running a few more uh, ambushes than we had run before, but uh, it, it hadn't changed right away, and I think Hawkins was just feeling out things. Uh, he got a feel for things in that little brief time in June before we went on stand down, and then he was getting a better feel for everybody as we worked on O'Reilly, and uh, and that was when you're on a fire base, it's a real pain in the neck. It's hot. Uh, you got no sunshine. It hits 120 in the sun all the time. Uh, and you're working to keep up the wire, you're checking the claymores and all this stuff, and you're, you're continually out there doing stuff. You're running recons out into the jungle and coming back, making sure the NBA aren't scooting up around you and stuff like that. So it was, I never liked working there. I really was much more comfortable in the jungle. Mm -hmm. Even though it was humid, it felt better because I was in the shade. <laughs> It'd be 95 in the shade with 95 humidity, but it was better. <laughs> It's all relative, and I and also I felt I had more control of what's going to happen to me when I was in the jungle, uh, in the even though that was not really true, but on the fire base you were like on a target. They know where you are, and we didn't like them to know where we were. We could help it. So. Okay. Now we're there. Oh, O'Reilly. They said there was a Vietnamese artillery unit there. Yeah. So what impression did you have of them? I didn't have much dealings with them, but they they work on a whole different level. You know. They're more basic, you know, they'd have chickens uh, that they'd be, you know, slaughtering for de de uh, to eat. Uh, they tended to, you had to watch your stuff, they tended to latch on to anything that wasn't watched too closely, so they'd steal your sea rations if they could get them. Uh, so you just sort of, you know, kept them at arm's length. Uh, we had a couple of Vietnamese working with us. We had our interpreter, uh, Long. He was a uh, Arvin, that's Army of Vietnam. Uh, staff sergeant. He was very good. Everybody liked him. Uh, we would buy rice from him. He would go home once a month and pick up these bags of minute, army, Vietnamese minute rice is what we called it. And he, you know, a little bag and he'd sell it to us for 25 cents a bag. And, uh, and, we'd, you know, and we used that to supplement the sea rations to make it taste better. And I, I was, I'd walk through the forest and, or the jungle and I'd have a bag of that, I'd be chewing on it. You know, it'd be raw. But you know, you'd had enough saliva, and it, and then I could sort of, wouldn't get hungry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Wilcox said, yeah, he says, after you told me about that, he said, I started doing the same thing. He said, that's a really pretty good idea. But you know, and we just did things like that. But uh, a lot of guys would buy the rice. And Long was talking about his brother and his brother had a cleft palate, and he was saving the money so they could have the operation done to cure him. You know, so and it, we liked the guy. Yeah. And did you also have a Kit Carson scout with you? We had Kit Carson scouts. Uh, Bob Counts in my platoon had his own Kit Carson scout, 
and usually every platoon had a Kit Carson scout. Uh, some of them were good, some of them were, you know, they didn't like the war before, they don't like it now. <laughs> so, it, you know, it, uh, most of the guys did not have a great deal of trust in the Kit Carsons, you know. Okay. And what was a Kit Carson scout? A Kit Carson, for anybody who had never seen them, these were NVA soldiers who had come over to our side, chew, that we call Chew Hoy, open arms. And they would Chew Hoy, and then the agreement was, they could Chew Hoy, all right, we would like to make you a scout. And if you become a scout, you help lead us, and sh you know, keep us out of trouble when you you know, the NBA are around, you'll see signs and stuff like this, and explain it to us. And then, uh, and as a result, you get paid this much money. And, we, and I don't know what they're paying, but it, from a Vietnamese person, point of view, it was a lot of money. So, yeah, it was pretty enticing for these guys. And some of them had relatives in the South and they, you know, they, they would do that. Uh, and that's what we used them. And so you always had one guy in the unit who was a, a handler. He, he was taught Vietnamese and he would deal with the guy. And so when his scout went back to the rear, which they'd go back once a month, he went with them because you know, that was his job, mm -hmm. so he had to keep track of them. And, uh, and he might go down to the village, but he'd be there when he came back so that everybody knew, all right, that's my scout, and then he'd come back out. As a result of that, a uh, couple times that we got shot at, Bob Counts wasn't there because his scout had to go back. So as an interpreter and a scout hander, that's really good because you get to the rear a lot more than mm -hmm. the other guys do. Of course, you have to, if your scout's going up at point, you're the slack man, so it doesn't, it's not always perfect, but uh, every job is that way. Right. Um, now, as you get um, at the end of June, beginning of July, uh, now things around Ripcord or at Ripcord start to heat yeah. up, and so what are your experiences like about that point? Well, that, at that time, I remember when the, on the, well, Charlie Company got hit, which I think was the 2nd of July, yeah. and uh, we, you know, we're a couple, uh, five kilometers away maybe six or seven from where they are. Uh, and uh, we heard, you know, of course, we're doing radio and we're, we're running our security at night and everything, and then uh, we're still up on O'Reilly. And then uh, we heard that they're under fire. We could see, you know, it's four or five o'clock in the morning, you could see the shooting going on way out there because mm -hmm. they're on a hill and we're looking down. And we were monitoring what was going on on the radio. And, you know, and it was like, oh, this is not good. And my thought was, when I heard all this, I heard they lost eight people and had all these wounded. I said, well, I, can, I would bet money that we're going to take their place. Because I thought about it, it would make sense to bring them to O'Reilly, let them get refitted, get new people, and send us out there because we're all, you know, we've been here. But that's not what the, uh, the colonel did. The colonel you know, got a new captain, he brought in the, Wilcox and gave them new men and then sent them out back into the jungle, which I, ooh, <laughs> it's not the way I would have done it, but I understand his concept, you know, don't want the guys to get gun shy and just keep them going, but it's, you lost your company commander, you lost a bunch of guys, and, and all of a sudden now you got all these new guys and you're going back in the jungle right away. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. To me, that's kind of, there was an opportunity to do something, and I thought they, they would have, but they, they got one day off and, and they're back out there. So, And then it wasn't too long before they're, you know, now we hear about them fighting up on Hill 1000 with helping the Delta Company. And so it's like, so we're hearing stuff, and we're up, and they were over in Riley, doo -doo 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 -doo, nothing going on here, you know, the Arvin are firing some rounds here and there, but, uh, you know, we're fine. And the NVA had attacked O'Reilly the month before we got there, and they had. And O'Reilly was extremely steep. I mean, it was almost like that. I mean, you drop a helmet. If your helmet came off, it went a long way. And the Arvin, the NVA had tried to do a sapper attack, and they were in the wire. And uh, when they were discovered, and the NV the Arvin killed like 70, 80 people. They were just throwing grenades down at them. It was like shooting fish in a barrel, you know. And I think that maybe two Arvins were killed. So they had really decimated them. 
So, no matter where we, you know, this time there's nobody out there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, well, but I know that I said this can't last. We're going to be going someplace, and then uh, finally the tenth of July they said, "Okay, we're going to go. We're taking you out towards Hill over by Hill 805," and they we combat assaulted out there and dropped us into the jungle. And what was really scary about that is that we got off the helicopter, we got formed up, and we could hear shooting in all sorts of directions. It wasn't aimed at us. Now, we, we never, ever were close enough to other units that were getting shot at. But here we are, we could hear other guys shooting. We said, oh, this is scary because, you know, there's lots of big, they're not just shooting for fun. They're shooting because there's NDA there. So, you know, and they might have been five, six hundred meters away, but it was still, put it made us really tense. And there was a company from another battalion, 2501, that was, I think, on top of 805. And well, not yet. Yeah, okay, but they landed around the same time that you did. They were landing about the same time. And then, and so we wandered, we positioned ourselves, and then finally, on the 12th, I believe it was the 12th of uh, July, we assaulted Hill 805 with Delta uh, 2501. And they came one side, we came from the other. And, uh, and you know, they had prepped it with uh, artillery and, and bombed it, and they had dropped uh, tear gas on it. Because I remember smelling the tear gas. It wasn't very strong by the time we got there, but there was nobody there. Mm -hmm. It was very nice. It was like, just the way we'd like it, you know. And uh, so we set up, and Delta Company was supposed to be, you know, they had most of the hill. We had a little saddle. And uh, that night, uh, there might have been, I'm not sure if that was when, might have been that evening, or it was sometime during the day, uh, Jim Knoll was wounded with his, uh, and his radio man, uh, Brady. Because they were medevac down. I think that might have been that night. Mm -hmm. But they, they got wounded somewhere in that period of time. But that night, uh, the NVA attacked Delta Company, and apparently they didn't know that we were on their flank. And so once things started, then uh, Hawkins said, all right, open fire and just keep it down there. And we were raking their, their flank, and that we, did, we took no casualties at all in our unit because they weren't planning for us to be there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've learned years later that the NVA, before they make an attack, they're very particular about getting everything just right. And apparently, even you don't vary from that. If the boss said, everybody attack this way, everybody attack this way. You get hit from the side, don't worry about it. That's not your problem. And that's the way they did stuff. And if, I didn't know that then. I learned years later. Mm -hmm. But uh, a number of officers who had dealt with them said, yeah, that's how they do things. And so anyway, the they made their assault. We we raked them on the sides, and uh, they took some casualties up there on uh, 805. But overall, didn't have too many. Mostly wounded. And I, you know, next thing next morning, uh, they said, "Okay, Alpha Company, you guys are going down in the valley." And so we were thinking, "Oh, good," <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I, you know, looking for whatever we could find. You know, somebody said, "Oh, we're supposed to be finding uh, grave sites," and it, it doesn't matter. Whatever. We're going to be looking for whatever. So we, we, we head out, and again we're working as separate platoons. And most of the time, the, the CP was with first platoon because this time, uh, Pahiza had come on to take over first platoon. Uh, Wilcox had been promoted and moved on to the Charlie Company. So Pahiza was another West Pointer who was anxious to get in there, and they got him. Uh, Hawkins brought him in. And so it was Pahiz and myself and Jim Knoll were the platoon leaders. And we had a new Ford Observer an officer that was uh, Steve Olson. And uh, he was working with his RTO, Floyd Alexander. And, uh, but so CP was working with 1st platoon a lot, sometimes with 3rd platoon because 3rd platoon had lost their platoon leader. And their platoon sergeant, I don't think uh, Hawkins, trusted as well. He, he was relatively new. He hadn't been there a long time. So Hawkins was, and that's pretty typical of what they would do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were, uh, during that period of time, we were, you know, my guys were getting 
they were all nervous. And uh, and I, you know, I had maybe 20 guys in the field, more or many. And uh, we would, we got to be really quiet. <laughs> the platoons are notoriously noisy. Ask the recon guys. The recon guys hated companies, line companies, because they're too many people and they make too much noise. But we were, we were so tight and so frightened about, you know, we might run into something. Let's keep quiet. Maybe they won't know where we are. And so, and we were still looking for them, but we wanted to find them before they found us. And so we were moving around and we found some bunkers and, and I managed to gas my, some of my guys while we were gassing the bunkers and everybody told me never to touch CS again. Uh, but we did, we never ran into any NBA. So, and then finally, after a couple days of doing that, we ended up with a CP. And when that happened, oh man, all I heard was complaints from my troops about, when are we gonna get rid of the CP? They're too noisy. You know, yeah, they are gonna find us, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we never did get rid of the CP because then we ended up joining somebody else. And, uh, but before that had happened, there was one period of time when we were still working separately. Uh, again, my guys were very nervous. And I only had, you know, I had so few people, I only had really two squads. So this squad were walk point today, second squad walks yet tomorrow. So it was, a, I think the second squad's turn to walk point. And uh, uh, the sergeant comes to me and says, uh, they won't walk, no, he wants to walk point. And I said, what do you mean no, he wants to walk point? No, they don't want to. It's too scary out there. I said, well, we can't stay here. We're going to have to go. And I said, I can't have first squad do it. They just did, they just walked point yesterday. They did their day. It's your turn. Well, I can't get anybody to walk. I said, no, screw this. You know, so I figured, well, I, you know, at, at this point, you know, it's like, what do I do? Give a direct order. And if they refuse a direct order, then well, I got to get rid of them. That means I have to call in a helicopter. I ain't doing that because I didn't want a helicopter showing off our position even anymore. And I didn't feel that I didn't want, I didn't want to challenge them on this. So I said, all right, hell, I'll walk point. So I grabbed my radio man. I said, let's go. And we start out. And I, it wasn't too long before they come up and the second squad comes up and says, get off a point. We got somebody walk point. They walk point. And later that, that night, I heard from, I don't know who, somebody told me. And I always thought it was uh, Tommy Swain. Tommy says, oh, no, I, I talked to you. But he didn't even remember me, so mm -hmm. <laughs> it's possible that he did talk to me. But somebody told me, he said, you know, LT, you know why they walk point? All right, so you're talking about this business about uh, walking point yeah. and you're taking it over. So the one guy says, he says, uh, LT, you know why they didn't want, to, want you to walk point? I said, I didn't think about it. I said, I just, I got somebody to walk point. He said, well, it's not that you're really popular or anything. It's just that nobody wanted the responsibility of running the platoon if you got killed. And I thought years later, I'm thinking about that, it made good sense. Platoon sergeant was brown. He'd only been platoon sergeant for a few weeks now. The guys didn't have any experience behind him as platoon sergeant. I think if Leverett had been there, they'd have said, "Go ahead, LT." <laughs> you know, but I think that was part of it. And uh, and the the other ones looked at him. And he said, "I don't want to be in charge of this outfit." You know, and if he gets killed, then I got to make the decision. So this, it's interesting, uh, but it worked, mm -hmm. and I never had the problem again. But uh, I wasn't really happy being on point, but I, I didn't see another way around it other than, and if you don't, and I felt that if I didn't do what they're willing to do, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're not gonna have any mm -hmm. faith in me at all. And so, and then, like, you know, then we did, ended up with the CP, and by this time, you know, finally, it's, I think it was probably, the, it was the 18th of uh, July. We, we were supposed to get a resupply and so we're on an LZ, and the LZ is maybe it's about one and a half, two kilometers from Ripcord. And we can actually see Ripcord from where we are. We're, we're standing there waiting for the helicopters to come in, you know. 
And as we're, we're standing there, we see we can see the Chinook coming into the ripcord. And we hear, I remember hearing the 51 caliber machine gun fire. And the next thing I know, you see the, the Chinook and the blades go out of sync as it got hit in the engine. And then it nose dived or came down on the rear end, I don't recall, but crashed into the uh, fire base. And it turns out it was carrying uh, it was carrying uh, fuel, and it landed on the on the ammo dump, the one one hundred five ammo dump, and uh, it went also where the fuel other fuel bladders were, and uh, it just when it looked to us, you know, it just you see this big explosion, a mushroom cloud goes up, and we're looking at this, and oh man, there's got to be all sorts of people being killed up there, you know, and my first thought. After, after thinking about that thing, man, I hope they didn't have the mail on that helicopter. <laughs> to see where your priorities are mm -hmm. when you're out in the jungle. It's, uh, I hope they don't get killed, but there better not be any mail on there because they'd get burned up. As it turns out, one man was killed. One of the guys on the helicopter got trapped underneath and they weren't able to get him out. And it, it took longer than it seemed to us. It took maybe 30 seconds. But, and then later on that day, our resupply helicopter came in and a couple of guys that we had were going back for R&R, &R, so they hopped on. And then uh, we had either five or six guys get off that helicopter. And I know that, and I've tracked down four of the five, four of them, and I know that they were new guys for our unit. Mm -hmm. And so, and I got, I have at least two of them were for me. One was uh, Gary Foster, and the other was uh, Don Kiefer, and they. And these guys were cherries. These, this is their first day in the jungle. Well, they're flying by the fire base and it's blowing up, you know. And then they join us in the jungle. And the next day, uh, they got everybody situated. And the next day, we're walking down the trail and uh, we stopped because I had taken the wrong turn. We we're going to tie up with the first platoon, as I remember. And as we're, we're waiting until I get turned around, uh, two NVA walk up on uh, Captain Hawkins and his RTO. And they were just boop, 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 just walking along, had their guns at sling. They didn't know we were there. And uh, Hawkins looks, holy mackerel, looks at his radio man. His radio man can't get his gun fast enough. And Hawkins got his gun, shot them both, killed them. And, uh, and that was, so for the guys that there, their first day in, these new guys, the first day they see the fire base blow up, their second day were killing NVA right away. And every day after that, we ran into NVA. And that's the experience that these guys had. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, was the, uh, that was the 19th. The 20th, we found the combo line down in the valley. And we tapped into it and we started listening to what they were saying. And we found out it was, I believe, between the regimental headquarters and their mortar section and they were directing fire onto ripcord. And they said, well, and that when you tap into it, it drops in volume. So they were going to, they said, well, we got to, must be a break in the line. So they're sending teams out to check for us. So first platoon was set up ambushes on both ends and they sprung one ambush and wounded some NVA that ran off into the jungle. And, and then while we're waiting there, we were picking up water down by the stream. And one of my guys, Miller, he looks down and he sees an NVA come out on a rock scouting us, and he kills him with his M79 and plays him out. And uh, and so that, that was the kind of stuff that was going on, you know. And then we finally get back. We said, you know, got late, and the captain says, all right, we're just going to go back to where we were last you know, last night, which is unusual, but we had to. And so, and then the next morning, I think third platoon leads off, and they run into two, N two NVA coming up the trail. And they fire them up. They wound one and kill one. And then, uh, and we go looking for the body of the NVA that we left the day before and it had been removed. It was gone. And so we check these guys and then we search the area out looking for more NVA. Didn't find any. Head up. Now, this is the 21st. We head up to a new NDP and Chuck waited till the last minute to leave, so it was almost dark. And they scouted a place to go about. Uh, I guess it's probably maybe 500 meters away. And then 
I was tailing Charlie at the time. We had we were the last platoon, and I left uh, Walker and Russ Walker and uh, uh, Robert Janelle, who we called Sparky. We left them behind with the radio, and they were to look for any trail watchers that might be following us. And uh, and then we went. We were only 100 yards from them, and then uh, it wasn't much more than a half hour. And all of a sudden, they fire up, and they killed one of one NVA and wounded another. And ran off. And uh, when they searched the body, they found that the guy had had a map of positions on Ripcord. He had been a recon sergeant who was checking Ripcord in preparation for an attack on Ripcord. And uh, I don't know if he delivered his message or not, but uh, you know, or maybe he was going to be scouting. But he was doing something, but he never made it. And so somebody booby trapped the body, you know. So in case they, when the NBA come to pick him up, maybe get a few more. Uh, they put a you know hand grenade underneath it and stuff like that, and then uh, ended up we set up for the night, and, and around 11 o'clock that night we heard the, an explosion down by that area. So we know that they picked up the body. If they're smart, they would have used grappling hooks and pulled the body and then waited a while. But we don't know what they did. We we like to antagonize them like they antagonized us. So, <laughs> but uh, so we spent the night there on this hill. And the next morning, it was the 22nd, the plan was, the plan that I was told, and this is what I remember, and uh, we were going to leave that hill, go to the southeast, to down the valley and up this other side to this LZ, and then we were supposed to get resupplied. That's what I remember for that day, because this was my birthday. I was thinking, oh, resupply, maybe my wife planned it enough so she could send the package in time, because you, know, you, you never know. Maybe I'll get a package from home. Always looking for mail. So that's what we were, I thought we were going to do. And I think that was the original plan. But what happened is that first platoon headed out the first thing, went down into the valley, <clears throat> and then later on they were called, told to come back. Apparently, and I don't remember this, but other people told me that they ran in. They got twisted around and actually fired at each other for a little bit. Nobody got hurt. but. Mm -hmm. You know, and then they got reorganized. But it was my impression that I remembered was that they went down and they were able to just get to the other LZ. And then Hawkins got word from uh, from the colonel. He didn't want us to go over there. He wanted us to go north. So we had to wait for first platoon to get back. So, and then first platoon came back. By this time, we'd been on this. We've been on this hill for you know. To, it's almost one o'clock. About one o'clock now. And we, by rule, you're off of there by nine because the NVA don't have enough time to set up mm -hmm. an attack. And we had smelled NVA in the morning, and we sent riffs out, but nobody saw anything positive. Somebody said they thought they saw a hand, but you know, but you know, it's like that kind of thing. Uh, we, we had picked up so much NVA equipment, we thought the odor was coming from that. And the, the NVA smelled different than GIs because their giant is more fish. Ours is beef and chicken, and so we have a, a different odor. And we didn't use deodorant, but we all smelled the same badly. <laughs> so if, you're, if the wind's right, you can smell them, and they, I'm sure they can smell us. And uh, we smelled them, but... Hey, we didn't see anything on the rifts, and you know I think they were further away than the rifts were going, and they moved in gradually. And uh, at any rate, when first platoon got back, then uh, Chuck said, "Okay, that's Captain Hawkins." He said, "All right, we well, take your platoon and head north because uh, we were set up, and it was the right place to go." So we headed out to the north. And by now it's close to 1.30, we've got 100, 175 meters away from the platoon, from the company, and we're strung out. I had 16 guys with me, two of them were cherries, and the rest have been out there a while. And we got less than 200 meters away from the company. My point man runs into an NVA unit setting up a mortar in the, in the trail. Well, you don't run into mortar units because they're behind all the troops. 
So I assumed what had happened, and I, and I found this out just from years later, the fact that the NVA set up and they're told to do this. And if you if something gets tossed in the works, they don't know how to handle it. Whereas if, and I think we walked up on them, they heard us coming, and they moved aside and let us come through. And then after we got past, they closed it up. Because they were told, you're going to attack when, when the, after the mortars go off, go up the hill. So we're behind them, but we don't know it. We run into this mortar squad. McVeigh's up my point man. He sees him. He comes back and says, there's somebody up there. I said, what do you mean there's somebody up there? <laughs> Why don't you shoot? Oh, well, I thought it might have been ours. And I said, oh, shoot. I said, all right. So I got a new, I get two guys to go up. It's uh, Jernell and uh, Walker. We work together a lot. So they go up and they run into the NVA. And we're behind, right behind them. The NVA opened fire with their, they, they blow down a, open up with machine guns, AKs, and they fire an RPG, blow this tree down in front of us. You know, and my, my radio man gets shot in the leg, breaks his leg. I think it broke his leg, but anyway, he wasn't able to go. So we're trying to get him out of there, drop, lose his rucksack, and that's where the radio is. But we're getting so much fire, nobody wants to get the radio, so I shoot the radio up so it wouldn't get into enemy hands. We go back, we drop back 10 yards or so. Meantime, the mortars are going off. They're hitting the company with tear gas and high explosive. And they're actually making an assault, the NBA are making a, an assault right behind the, the mortars. And I'm told about this later because I, I heard the mortars going off, but they weren't hitting me because we were too close to them. And about that same time, the NBA that had let us through then started shooting at us. They figured once the shooting starts, they can shoot anywhere. And Gary Foster, who was at one of the cherries, he's at the end. He's an E6. He's busy. He sees an NVA coming down the trail. He throws a gun up, <coughs> drops him. And he says, that's the only NVA I saw full time. He said, after that, they all behind trees. He said, guy behind a tree shooting at us. He said, I'd throw a grenade and they wouldn't shoot anymore. And there'd be another one, he said, I'd throw another grenade. He threw a dozen grenades. And every time he threw one, they quit shooting. He says, dead? I don't know, I don't care. He says, they quit shooting. <laughs> and he got hit with satchel charges. Uh, one blew his shirt off, blew out both his eardrums. He had a second degree burn on his left shoulder. Uh, he had multiple shrapnel wounds. My platoon sergeant, who's back there with him, takes it on the opening volley, takes a bullet through the face, goes in the Goes in once, I think his mouth is open, went in the, through the mouth, goes, takes out part of his tongue and his uh, jaw goes out the side, the other cheek. Didn't kill him, didn't hit anything vital, but he couldn't do anything but keep his head down so he didn't choke on his own blood. So he was out of everything. His radio man, Mulvey, got hit with shrapnel. He lost his radio. We condensed, and it took a while for those guys to join up with us. Uh, and I think, I don't know if Marty got back there with them right away or if it had been later, but Marty went back there, he patched up the... Uh, That's Martin Glenn on the medic. Yeah, the bar medic, uh, as soon as he could. And then they, they I remember them hollering Kerr he as they came in so we wouldn't shoot them because we'd been separated from them. And so we got into a condensed uh, perimeter. And uh, I doubt if the perimeter was more than uh, four meters wide. Uh, 10 meters long, some maybe 12 meters long. It was, but there were only you know there were 17 of us in there, and I was in the pretty much in the middle, directing and just checking the you know making sure everybody everybody's down. They're firing that movement. They don't see anybody. We can't see five meters. I mean the jungle's so thick, but you'd see bushes moving. So you'd shoot there, and because we're laying down, they're shooting back at us, but they're shooting over us, and. Uh, and it was stable like that, we're shooting them. And apparently somewhere in that period of time, I don't know exactly when it happened, one of the uh, NCOs, uh, Tom Schultz, got, he had been really nervous for a couple days and he had bad feelings about this whole thing. And something happened, uh, somebody said he was, they were next to him and 
a grenade went off or satchel charge and he lost his glasses and uh, they said he disappeared and uh, we don't know if he got blown away or if he moved and got killed but we found his body uh, after the battle up towards the company he may have panicked and tried to get to the company we don't know what happened to him it's any number of scenarios that could have happened but uh, at any rate he he didn't survive but I had and then but I had no radio my third radio was due for backlog because it wasn't working so I don't have contact with Hawkins my company commander and he's not coming to help us because I heard all the shooting going on there I figured oh he's in, He's got his own business. So I pretty much figured, okay, we're on our own here. Okay, yeah, you're going to do. At one point, the uh, Martin Glenn and the medic came to me, LT, what are we going to do? He said, we got to get out of here. And I said, we got no place to go. I said, they're all around us. And I said, there's not as many over there to the, down by the gully. I said, but I'm not going into low ground. I said, we won't make it. I said, we got guys here that can't move too quick, quickly. I said, we're not going to go down there. I said, all I can see is we're going to stay where we are right now. You know, I, don't, I don't think it's good. I said, I know. It isn't good. <laughs> but it's all we can do. And that was the decision we made. It turns out it was probably the best decision I could have made, at least for surviving that way. And at some point, after we had you know, gone through this, there was one point when apparently the NBA were making a concerted effort to get us to wipe us out because all of a sudden they were throwing satchel charges after satchel charges, grenades and sh lots of shooting and, and it was coming from all sides and, uh, and at that point I happened to be up on my knees and a grenade goes off 10 feet away when a, a Chicom grenade, well they're not very good grenades luckily and uh, they don't break up in lots of little pieces but I got hit on the thigh and the shoulder and the and the uh, arm, but nothing serious, a little more than skin deep, you know. But another piece of that shrapnel hit uh, Galindo, my machine gunner, you know, lodged in his cheek, you know, and he ended up with tunnel vision from that injury. But, uh, and somebody says that other part of that hit uh, Sparky, uh, Jernell, and he died from it. Uh, and I don't know if that was what hit him or, but, you know, that's the way those things are. You can. And he was further away. It just, you don't know. It's, and one of the things I've learned is that when the shooting starts, everything's chaotic and, you know, all the bets go out the window. Uh, it's just the luck of the draw. Things happen that you, you know, you may do something completely right and get killed, do something completely wrong and survive because there's so much stuff flying around. You don't know what's going to happen. Your best bet is to stay low and that won't guarantee anything either. Okay, so, so what? enables you guys to survive that attack? Well, we we kept shooting at them, you know, we were, and the guys were pretty good controlling their shooting, but they kept shooting, and then, and this last, and I don't know how long this attack lasted, probably five minutes, ten minutes, I don't know, and I wasn't checking my watch, <laughs> but, the, you know, and, but they were so close to us that their satchel charges were going past us. You know, the hand grenades are going both sides. They're going back and forth. They might have hurt their own guys as much. But eventually, they, it just came, to, it didn't completely stop, but it just slowed down. A lot. And I heard later that the guys in the rear monitoring the NBA broadcast said that one NBA unit said, we've got, we've got this group you know, surrounded. We're going to finish them off. And that may have been us they were talking about. It could have been the company. But they said that person didn't broadcast anymore. So whoever it was didn't do well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so meantime, my radio man, even though he was wounded, finally got the other radio operating. And uh, that was when I finally made contact with, with uh, Hawkins. And I don't know, I think it was an hour after the battle started, I don't know, something like that. I made contact with Hawkins. And, uh, and I remember he said, you know, we're in the clear. You're not supposed to talk about how you're doing in the clear, but it was necessary for him to know. Mm -hmm. And I said, he says, how, you know, what, what are your casualties? I said, I've lost a pair. And he said he'd lost a basketball team that he knew of. And, uh, and he says, okay, he says, you know, I know where you are now. He says, so he can employ the artillery and the 
cobras and everything else better. And then he proceeded to do more of that. In the mean, and they've been, you know, what he had been doing up there, I've been told, but they were doing all sorts of fighting and trying to reorganize. They had been really disorganized. I, my unit was fortunate because we all stayed together. Mm -hmm. The other groups got uh, disarrayed, and it, it took them a while to get and get back to to fighting. And uh, so there was lots of going on, and I and I can talk. About, I'm not going to really talk about what they were doing because it's really second, yeah. third hand. Yeah. But uh, eventually. Uh, so we had Cobras coming in, and, and then finally Chuck said, okay, we got a jet coming in, going to drop some 250-pound bombs, you know, keep everybody down, so I tell everybody to get down. And uh, now, I don't remember him saying that it's going to be really close. In fact, I thought it, accidentally it was really close. And then, but maybe he said it was going to be close, I don't remember. But, all I know is it was really close, <laughs> and as I recall, there were two bombs. One of them landed uh, like maybe 75 meters from us. There's 250-pound bombs are supposed to be 200 meters away, you know, for safety purposes. And the other one, as you know, I don't know if anybody ever, could, ever verified it, but I, the other one did not go off. And I remember seeing it when we got back to the company later that day, just you know, sticking in the ground. But maybe you know, memory's not good all the time. But the one went off. I remember <laughs> that was no doubt about that. And when it went off, I mean, the skies turned black. The sun was obliterated for a bit. Uh, and all the every tree between us and the bomb that was more than eight feet high was cut down. I mean, it. And as you got closer to the bomb, there was less and less. So I mean, it, all of a sudden we could see. We could see some places 30 meters now uh, because the uh, bomb had cleared everything. And it was where most of the NBA had been operating out of. And that's where they were you know, launching their attacks after they regrouped. And so they really got decimated with that. And then it was only after that, I don't know, it was 10, 15 minutes after that, I'm up on my knees again. I don't know what the hell I'm thinking. I look back as a, as a smarter guy in old age, I'm thinking, Jesus, dumb shit. <laughs> so I'm up on my knees and I'm, I'm looking and I see the NBA soldier, come, a jet's coming over and he's running down the trail towards us, carrying an RPD, which is a machine gun. And so I, I tell the guy, hey, shoot that guy. Well, they're all laying down. They can't see him. So I thought, oh, I, I guess I gotta shoot him. So I throw my gun up and I start shooting at him. Well, I'm scared. And and I see the bullets hitting the bushes and trees to the left and to the right of him. And he stops, you know, and he's looking this way and that way. And he doesn't, he's scared too. And I'm firing single shot, boom, 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 boom. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to aim. But I, I'm scared, you know, I don't want to stop because I don't want him to shoot at me. And then I run out of bullets 18 rounds later. And then he runs off into the bushes because he's just as scared as I am. As far as I know, I didn't touch him. I may have wounded him, but I don't think I did. And uh, he runs off the bushes. I get a, get a cobra online and send the cobra after him. And that. All right, so we've gotten you through sort of the, the climax of the battle itself on July 22nd. And uh, so the enemy, the airstrikes are brought in, the company is connected with itself, but you're still out there in the field at that point. Yeah. So now what happens? Well, as the same, after we, after I had an incident with the NBA, uh, then we were able to, probably a, another hour from that, we joined up with the rest of the company. And so we, we proceeded to, you know, first thing we started doing, it was just get, starting to get dark. And uh, we proceeded to check all the rucksacks looking for water. Because by this point, nobody had water. Uh, and if you lost your rucksack, there might be water on it, but you had to find it. Uh, and so, and I remember getting a drink of water, and it was just the best water I had ever tasted in my life. I mean, earlier in the day, I fully expected not to survive the day. And it was only after getting radio contact with the company that I thought there was a chance. So. Then I finally got some water. So it was wonderful. And we 
and we you know distributed the water to the wounded and everybody. And then we started setting up the perimeter for the night because we assumed that we were going to be hit again that night. And uh, we spent, you know, at that point we had at least 12 or 14 people who were seriously wounded, and then we had we lost the company had lost about 12, 14 people altogether, and uh, every, all but six people were wounded. Uh, one of the guys, two of the guys in my platoon. Uh, made it through the battle without being wounded. Uh, one of them got hit with a piece of uh, of the flare ring at night and got a gash on his head, so <laughs> he ended up getting wounded anyway, but a different, different way. But uh, so we set up and we fully expected to, to spend the night uh, fighting the NBA. And we tried to dig in, but the, it was very difficult because it had a lot of big trees and lots of roots. And you just you hunkered down someplace and waited. And they had flare ships flying around all night long, uh, waiting for the attack. And, and they were dropping flares continuously. Uh, there was no attack. In the meantime, the uh, battalion was firing interdiction rounds on artillery in places where we thought the NVA were, where they might be traveling to to get come up there. So they are hitting the valleys and the streams based on the information they had. And a lot of that probably was the reason the NBA were unable to to do anything. The other thing is they lost a lot of people in the battle with us. I mean, we lost a lot of people for our on our end, but they lost apparently even more. And they were unable to successfully keep the pressure up. They didn't have the people anymore. So I remember that night it was I tried to stay awake, you know. And it wasn't like it was fifty percent guard, there was nobody else, you know guard with you. And it was like you got the radio, you assigned somebody to hang on there with the radio with you and you both pretty much kept your eyes open. And if I had just just before daylight the flare ships went off. Because up where they are it's daylight. Mm -hmm. Yeah the jungle was still pitch dark. <laughs> and they left. And I just couldn't I fell asleep in the dark, you know, I was like and I slept for maybe a half hour and woke up and okay. And I felt better and I was still alive. And then uh, Captain Hawkins said that they had the Delta Company was coming in to relieve us. And uh, the day before, I, we didn't know, but on the 22nd, there were no other infantry units in the jungle. They had all been pulled out on the 21st. And they had looked at having Delta Company come in and give us a hand. But by the time they got them organized, uh, the, they, they prepped a fire. Uh, a uh, landing zone and it caught fire and then before they could they said well, well hold off a bit and by that time we had controlled things we had finally got to the point where okay looks like they got it under control we'll but we're leaving in the morning so uh, sometime that morning eight nine o'clock they show up coming walking down and uh, then they proceeded to uh, uh, Dynamite and C4 landing zone, and it was down in the, down where we were. Uh, we were supposed to go, you know, a kilometer up to this other landing zone. Well, they they couldn't haul everybody up there that needed to be hauled, so they blew an opening big enough to get the helicopter in. And then the first helicopter, I think, started flying out of there around 10 o'clock, and they had to just fly straight down about 100 150 feet through the trees, you know, trees all around them. Come straight down, pick up six guys, go straight back up, and then fly away. Very dangerous thing for the helicopters around the enemy because you're a target. Uh, but the NVA were so badly beat up, they weren't able to get close to us. And uh, so they, we took all the, the badly wounded out first, and then the dead, and then the uh, next level of wounded, and then the rest of us uh, went out. So I was back at Camp Evans by around noon time. And I was on the probably the second to last chopper out and talking to the last one. But then Delta Company came out after us and they were extracted by you know by two o'clock. So by two o'clock the entire area was evacuated. There was nobody left. Ripcord had been finished off as far as evacuation, they said by eleven o'clock. Mm -hmm. So we were the Delta Company were the last people to leave the jungle, and uh, we were the last unit to be assigned 
out there and get shot up. And then uh, got back to the rear, and I remember, to me, you know, this is, you have to understand, I didn't know at all what to expect. And whatever happened, I just assumed this is what, this is the way things are. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we get back to the rear, and uh, the first sergeant's there, and a bunch of the guys who were in the rear, and they were all, you know, congratulating us and shaking our hands and welcoming us back. And it was like, I'm thinking, what's this about? I was out there, I got, we got shot up, we got back. That's what we're supposed to do. And, you know, it didn't realize this, how bad things had been, you know, until maybe later. And then, I, you know, went, and I had also, during the fight, I lost a tooth. Uh, my new platoon, my new sergeant, the E6, was throwing grenades again when he was back with us and needed some fire cover. So I was giving him some fire cover. He throws a grenade. He obviously let it cook off a little bit before, and I, it's going out. I see it going out. I, I got to get down. <laughs> Thing goes off. Piece of shrapnel comes back. Went right between my lips. Hit my tooth. Shattered tooth. Skids up and lodges in my gum. Good thing I didn't have my mouth open. It would have gone through the back of my head, but no big deal. You know, it's like you know the adrenaline's flowing so much that day that it didn't, you know, there's no pain. So we get back to the rear. I go have my injuries looked at. They said, oh yeah, you lost that tooth, and we'll have to cut it out, come back tomorrow. They checked the shrapnel ones, they said, all right, that's minor. They said, they x-rayed in my head, and they said, hey, you only got that one piece. They said, They'll, that'll work its way out in a month or so, don't worry about it. So, yeah, and then I went, and then I, I have very little, I don't remember anything else in the time I was back at uh, Evans. Mm -hmm. The next thing I remember is we were going back in the jungle, and that was about uh, five days later. I had a whole bunch of new guys, mm -hmm. a couple of old guys, but not many. And the one, wounded ones ended up not coming back, and then there were a few that had been in the rear. And so I was going out with a pretty much a new platoon. My platoon, I had a whole new platoon sergeants because my other one got wounded. Gary Foster, who would have been my platoon sergeant, was. He never, he went back home, lost both eardrums, they sent him home. So he spent five days in the jungle. Mm -hmm. It was his entire tour. It was like, he got a silver star, which he deserved every bit of. Uh, I look back and I can see that his actions really helped us because if he hadn't been there, because everybody else got, was not working well at that end, and he was the one who kept the NBA from moving closer to mm -hmm. us in that end. So he, Probably, you know, he was very instrumental in uh, helping the platoon survive. And as it turns out, our platoon being out there where we were and being a, a thorn in their side was instrumental in helping the company survive. Because it turns out that the way their, their attack on that end of the company was broken up because they had to turn around and attack us. And so that left a gap where the company was able to move to and reorganize. So it's like I said, you plan something, <laughs> it all, it's just chaos and it, lots of things happen. And we, of course, we didn't. We only recognized that years later when we were thinking about it. But we finished up at, uh, and I, and I, they had a memorial service. I have no memory of that. I didn't know they had one until a couple years ago when I saw pictures. I said, oh, when was that? They said, oh, that was July, when, after uh, Ripcord. I said, really? Where was I? I may have been getting my tooth extracted. Uh, the guy said they went to Eagle Beach, and the water said went to Eagle Beach. I still don't ever recall that. But I, I'm looking back, and I'm sure there was so much mental stress that I just wasn't registering things, you know. But then August, uh, we're back out in the field. We're over working outside of uh, Catherine, and. Uh, that's how I finished my tour. Uh, I finished. I spent another month and a, I spent a month and a half more in the field, with the, and then I turned turned it over to a new platoon leader. And, and was that last month relatively quiet? Yeah, uh, we spent a, a, maybe a week outside of Catherine. One of the guys, I think, it was Larry Markhart, who did not get wounded on uh, July 22nd in my platoon. We're out there. We got new FO because the other one was killed. Uh, and he's putting in registration rounds in the field. So he, you, lots of times, their first round, they'll use smoke to figure out where they are. 
Hey, he was sure where he was. He, we hadn't moved far. He, he had him fire a, a high explosive round, and it wasn't where he was waiting for it to explode. And it came close to us. One piece came, hit my, hit Larry Markhart in the leg, broke his leg. So he went out. <laughs> so that was his tour. <laughs> he made it through twenty second, but he couldn't make it through when they were not getting shot at. And uh, and then we found out that when we tried another round, which is uh, they used a smoke round for the next one, and the uh, artillery guys were all screwed up. But then we tried it with the uh, with the mortars, and the mortars put it right where we expected it to be. So what happens is sometimes the guns get shifted and they don't re realign them, and, uh, and uh, so we think that's what has happened. So the rest of the time we were out there, we just used the mortars. They they were paying attention to detail, and we had no. Nobody coming after us. And from there, they took sent us over to Rakasan, and we provided security at Rakasan for maybe I don't know, maybe a month. I don't know how long we were there, and uh, and I don't know if we went back out in the field or not. But uh, middle of uh, September, I was uh, given the rear assignment, and I ended up being supply officer for headquarters company for Third Brigade, and that's how I spent and. Uh, being in the rear was nothing to me. Uh, we'd get mortared, and I would just, I, would, I wouldn't wake up, I'd sleep through it. Um, I woke up the first time we got mortared, and the mortars, the NBA would just throw three rounds in at two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning to, you know, screw with your sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then the siren would go off, and everybody would run to the bunkers, and a half hour later the siren would go off, and it was all clear, and we'd all go back to sleep. I did that the first time. A couple nights later, it happened again. Well, we're, I'm sleeping in a hooch now. I got actually, a, uh, I got a roof over me. I got netting around me, and I have, you know, five feet of sandbags piled around the whole outside. In reality, unless the bomb, unless the mortar landed in the in the hooch, you weren't going to probably get hurt. You know, so I guess in, in my in my subconscious, I just like it's nothing. So I slept through the next one. And uh, next morning, my mechanics and supply clerks said, LT, where were you last night? I said, what do you mean? I was sleeping. No, when, the, when they warned us. I said, we, we, you didn't show up at the bunker. I said, no, I didn't wake up. He said, what? <laughs> and these are guys who had never been in the field. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything was really scary to them. I said, I didn't wake up. I said, well, look, guys, I'm probably not going to wake up when these, we get, this is harassment fire. And I'll probably just sleep through it. But if you guys go to the bunker and there's a lot more firing going on, send somebody over to my hooch to get me up because I'm in charge of the inner defenses if we get a big attack. If, we're, if there's more than three or four rounds, there might be an attack going on. So I need to be awake then. <laughs> and, uh, and that's, but again, it was the difference in uh, what you expected. Sure. Yeah, I mean, what was the sort of the atmosphere like, your life like, I mean, back there in, in, on the base rather than being out in the field? Well, the guys, the guys I worked with, they were very nervous, but because they had not seen anything, and so you know everything made them nervous because they, they had heard all the stories, but they just that they weren't seeing the stories that you know it wasn't happening to them, mm -hmm. but they thought for sure it's going to happen any minute. The other thing is there were issues in the rear. Uh, there was pot uh, and other drugs, and there was alcohol. Uh, when I f first went to the rear, uh, the Army did not allow you to drink uh, regular alcohol unless you were an E6 or above. If you were, if you had, you're, you could be 40 years old, you couldn't buy it, you know. And, and they all, we all got ration cards, and I think we got three quarts of liquor a month, three bottles of wine, and so many cases of beer. Well, I didn't drink, <laughs> but I had a I had a supply sergeant who was helping me out, and he drank. So I took care of him because I gave him the liquor because he used his ration card up and he'd use mine up too. But uh, but later on they changed the rule. They said because the army recognized that you're forcing guys to find some other way, so they're going to pot. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. They changed the rule. And so, if you're 21, you could you could buy alcohol, but pot was available. But the guys that used it were just dumb as could be, because they would get caught, and they'd get an Article 15, and they would get 
written up and they'd lose more money. And then they would complain that the first sergeant is always picking on them. Uh, then they'd smoke another joint out there in front of the hooch and get caught again, or they'd end up having to burn shit all the time, you know, because the way they handled it, you know, if you, we had latrines and they're just outhouses and they had half a drum, you know, cut halfway of a 55 gallon drum, and all the, uh, all the, you know, all the crap went into that. And of course, they didn't want to infect the Vietnam with our germs, so we had to burn it. And we, they'd mix it with uh, fuel oil, and and they'd light it up, and they, the guys had to stir it. Terrible odor, and uh, it was considered to be a really bad job. And you usually got that everybody, all the enlisted men probably had an opportunity, but if you were always screwing up, you always got to burn it. That means you had to go down to the latrine, pull out the full barrels, put in new ones, take them, load them up onto the uh, mule, which is a, a little ATV, and then haul it out to a certain location up on the hill, and take them off, light them up, sit there and stir them until they're all burned up, and put them back. Hell of a way to spend your day. Mm -hmm. But uh, the drug issue was back and forth. Uh, it was more prevalent with the guys that were in the jump in the rear. Mm -hmm. Very seldom you see it in the jungle. The guys, other guys wouldn't tolerate it. They didn't want anybody, they didn't want you drinking, you know. You know, and guys once in a while bring a beer out there, and uh, I'm sure there was, al I know there was alcohol out there here and there. But the guys were not getting looped, mm -hmm. and they made, made sure they were paying attention. And, uh, and I, when uh, Lieutenant Brennan was out there for the FO, he had a bottle of whiskey with him, and you know, at the end of the day, We'd, we'd be at the CP talking to the captain, and he'd break out and give everybody a shot. And, you know, that was just like, that was it, yeah, you know. But uh, yeah. now, did, were there discipline problems on, in the rear that got worse? I mean, were there racial issues or things like that? I didn't experience any, but they, I knew they were around. I was aware of them uh, within the unit that I was dealing with. Uh, anybody, you know, the, the black guys and the white guys who were in the supply unit, they were all happy to be here. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's you know, it was a good job, and uh, and so they didn't, they didn't have issues. Uh, some of the other guys that were not assigned strictly to my section, uh, they had issues, and they they would get on the wrong side of the first sergeant. And uh, you know, that's one guy. I I talked to him a couple times. I said, you know, what are you what are you doing? And you're just you're just shooting yourself in the foot, and you've got nothing to gain by this. So, but you know, uh, it's the way it was. But there were there were racial issues, and they got worse as time went by. And by the time I left in '71, uh, it was becoming more of an issue. Um, again, I didn't experience it, uh, but I didn't have any pre any obvious prejudice. I mean, there might have been subconscious, but. I went through, you know, through all through grade school. I'd say 20, 30 percent of the kids were black. You know, I, I, that's who I played ball with. That's who I hung out with. Uh, you know, black kids, white kids, it's all the same to me. And I didn't realize there was racial issues until I started watching the news in the 60s. You know, <laughs> but again, it was, and I knew, that, and there were people who, when I got to high school, there were people who, you know, didn't like blacks, and I couldn't understand their their reasoning because. You know, it was just that way. Okay. Now, did you ever get an R and R? I did go to an R and R. I finally got that the, after I came out of the field. I went on R and R to uh, Hawaii with my wife. I met her there. By that time, I had. By the time I got out of the field, it turns out I had another case of cellulitis. Mm -hmm. It was now eating into the flesh on my uh, shin. And so when I came out of the field, I had a scab on it. And I thought it was just. Nothing special. And I went to the, stopped at the hospital and they said, well, I want to check this out. And so they looked at it and they said, ah, oh, yeah, it's a form of cellulitis. I said, here. They ripped off the scab. They didn't bother giving me any local anything. They said, yeah, you got to clean that out. And so they said, hold still. He said, it's going to hurt a little bit. They said, probably a really good idea if you hyperventilate a bit. And I said, really? He said, yeah. No, I started hyperventilating. He starts cleaning it out, you know, scrubbing it, and it, oh, you know, it, it hurts like hell. And they find it. 
said, okay. He says, yeah, that looks good. He says, now we got to pack it. He said, you might want to hyperventilate it. Hey, you know, whatever happened to Novocaine? I don't know. <laughs> Probably because I was an officer, they didn't want to. Get, so, uh, you know. So then it, they take this gauze, and it's about three feet of one inch wide gauze, and it's like a tincture of iodine on it or something. And they take that and they start stuffing it under the skin in this hole. It's about, oh, probably two by four inches long. And they're stuffing it under the skin and finally pack it all down, and then they put a bandage on it and hook me up to an IV, and I got. This time I got tetracycline and glucose. Mm -hmm. went, back to, went back there, found myself a bed, got four liters of that, and then they would, every morning, they would come there, take the bandage off, pull the gauze out, look at it, say, oh, look, you can see the white granules here. That's the uh, new flesh for me. Looking good. Got to put some more gauze there. <laughs> and so by the time I went on R&R, &R, I still had an opening there but it was reduced. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we can, we can you know, make it faster. We'll, we'll do a skin graft. I said, where are you going to get the skin? Oh, we'll take it off your butt. I said, oh, so I will have a sore spot here and a sore spot on my leg. Will it heal otherwise? They said, yeah. I said, okay. I'll wait it out. Mm -hmm. So when I got to uh, Hawaii with my wife, we, I couldn't go in the water. You know, but we had a good time. We, Rode around Oahu. Well, it doesn't take too long to ride around Oahu. Uh, yeah, I went to the zoo and just hung out. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was sort of a daze for me. Uh, my wife, that was her first long, really long trip. She flew from Jersey all the way, essentially nonstop, to uh, Hawaii. So she left the, our daughter back with my mother and her mother. And, uh, and then I got back, and so then I finished up my tour and uh, went out to a fire base again. We had to, we went out, we went out to Cap, Camp Carroll in, I think, February. They were setting that up, so I took uh, my guys out there, the supply guys, to get things set up, and we were there for uh, maybe a week or so. But it was kind of nice, and uh, we didn't have to go out in the sun. Mm -hmm. We had nice underground storage facilities. It was pretty good. And then I finished up my tour. And, uh, and while I was there, I had also I went down to Da Nang on a regular basis looking for supplies. Uh, we'd go down there to salvage uh, parts off of other trucks and stuff, so I'd take a mechanic and we'd do that. And uh, we'd spend the night there and then we'd come back. So now you're actually seeing areas that have a civilian population in them. And yeah, and I, and I took pictures when I, and by then I picked up a, a single lens reflex camera, so I'd take that along and I'd be shooting pictures as I'm going along. And I did, I got this one picture, I was going to bring it this year, I forgot. When we're going through Way, uh, there's a movie theater there. And they had the billboard and they had the big picture up there. And it's all, it's in French. And it's, uh, I think it said, uh, it was 12 Hours in Hell. It's a war film. Mm -hmm. And they have a picture, I think, of Rex Harrison or somebody up, or Rich, anyway, some guy. And they got this whole big thing out there. And I'm thinking, well, this is good. Here we are in the middle of war zone. Mm -hmm. They're showing war films. So I took a picture of that, and I blew it up into a. They had the, they had the uh, a photo lab available for for us to use. So I ended up blowing it up in like this, and you have all these Vietnamese in front of it, and, it, and it's uh, 12 hours in hell. And I said, yeah, this is kind of appropriate. Mm -hmm. so, but it just amazed me that you know, the life in a way they were going along with business as usual. Mm -hmm. uh, they. They very seldom, at that point, got any activity by the Viet Cong or the NBA, uh, and uh, that was always further out because we had, you mm -hmm. know, secured the area pretty well. But that changed after we left. Right. So, okay. So when do you actually leave Vietnam? I left Vietnam around the middle of uh, I think it was the fifteenth of March. Seventy-one now. Of seventy-one. Okay. And then I flew from there directly to uh, Travis Air Force Base in Washington, Fort Lewis, and. I checked out of the army there, they, and I, I, I like it. They said, "Oh, do you, do you have any ailments before you leave? You know, if you do, you know, we'll have the doctor examine you, and we'll treat them before we let you go." Mm -hmm. Well, heck, yeah, yeah. 
How's, it, how's your hearing? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you checked everything off. I'm, I'm out of here. Now, did you only have a two-year active duty obligation? That was my only active duty obligation at that point. And then I was supposed to be on the, in the reserves for the, for another six. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then a standby for some, a few years after that. Well, I got it. So I finished up there. They gave me a ticket, gave me all my money. I flew home. Uh, my family picked me up at, in the... Uh, in uh, Philly, and, uh, con and uh, before I left, I had wrote a letter to Fishing Game saying, "Hey, got a job? I'm coming back." And they nicely wrote me back, saying, "Well, we're not hiring right now, but uh, we'll keep you in mind if something happens." And so then, when I got home, I looked up the guy I had worked with for two summers, and uh, he said, "Well, whenever you get back, I'd like you to work with me." And uh, so I got back, and I talked to him, and I told him. He said, yeah, we're not hiring that now. He said, give me your phone number. Something comes up. He said, I'll let you know. So I collected unemployment for three or four months, and then I stood, and I was entitled to it for a year, and it was pretty good money. So I started looking for jobs in other states uh, in wildlife, and uh, then after about six months, uh, I get a call from my old boss, and he says, you're still looking for a job? I said, yeah. He says, well, i got a guy working for me. He's about ready to resign. I said, really? I said, good. He said, well, I'll let you know. About two weeks after that, he says, all right, he's resigned. Come on up and sign up the papers. Well, I found out years later, the guy that was about ready to resign, he was always fighting with my eventual boss. Mm -hmm. And they would have these drag out arguments. And so the other crew could hear them 100 yards away through the building, you know. And, and uh, Bob was his name, and Bob would get so pissed off at uh, Freddie, they said, God damn, Freddie, I quit. And he said, and Freddie said, all right, good. And then Freddie would call Trenton up and said, oh, Bob quit. He said, do you have that in writing? Mm -hmm. They said, well, no. He said, it's got to be in writing. So then Freddie made up a resignation for Bob. And the next time they got into a big heated argument, he pulls out the record and when Bob says, I quit. And he says, oh, yeah, if you do, sign that. And Bob signed it. That's how I got a job. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it worked a little better for you than it had for Bob. I lasted with Freddie for 12 years before we couldn't, before I couldn't deal with him. But <laughs> I have more tolerance than Bob did. And Bob ended up out of fishing game, but he was still working for the state. He he moved over. I think he ended up with radiation, and then and I ran into Bob years later. And he still liked Freddie. He said he just couldn't work with him, mm -hmm. and I understood that. <laughs> so, but and so technically that. It was probably going to be the end of my career, but then in 1973, I got a notice from the Army to show up for two weeks of summer training in Fort Polk, Louisiana again. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's like, and it says, if you do not report, uh, you will be, you could be uh, activated for six months. Well, I'm in, I work for the state of New Jersey. If you have any uh, service time, they don't pay, you know, for, uh, guard or anything else, they'll pay while you're away for the two weeks. So I got their pay, and then the Army paid me at the same time. So they flew me down there, I went to, I got to Fort Polk, I got there, come to where I was supposed to report, report in, the guy says, who are you? I said, no, Lee Wichita, I'm here reporting, uh, here's my orders. And I looked, I said, oh, you're a filler. And I said, whatever you say. I said, hell, fillers never show up. <laughs> I said, well, I'm here. Okay, well, they said, check in tomorrow, we'll see what we have for you. And I check in, nothing. Check in another day, nothing. So in the meantime, I'm sitting at the, down at the officers club, sitting by the pool, reading books. And then finally, after about a week, they finally said, well, they said, how about if you give a class? I said, all right. And they said, I said, what do you want me to give? They said, well, sit in on this class that we're having today. So I went there, sat in on the class, took notes. He said, give that class tomorrow. So I came back the next day, gave the class, and then the uh, following day, I said, well, you guys want me to do it again or what? And he said, no, that's good. And so I check in, and that's, that's all I did. Two weeks, you know, two weeks go by, I go home. And then I didn't hear from the Army again until they said my commitment was, was up years later. Okay. Now, did you have any trouble sort of readjusting to civilian life other than sort of being touchy about helicopters? <laughs> Not really. Uh, again, it was to me. It was like I didn't think that anything special happened to me. It was just. It was just. Uh, I just assumed everything was that way. 
And I didn't know anybody else. I didn't have contact with anybody else who was in the had been in the service during that period. So I started working for Fishing Game because I and I had to take tests. But because I was a veteran, I go to the top of the list if I pass the test. But I came out high anyway, so it was sort of a moot point. Mm -hmm. So some people knew I was a veteran, but it was not, nobody said that one or another. And I really didn't think about Vietnam again until I think it was 75 or 76. I was out hunting in the morning. I'd come off of the marsh, and I'm walking down this old railroad bed. Two other guys coming the other way. So we stop and talk. And I'm talking to this one guy, and he's asking how the hunting was and you know what the birds are doing. And as I'm talking to him, I'm looking at him, I'm saying, like, damn, he's familiar. Who, who is this guy? And uh, I couldn't place him, you know. And then finally, 10 minutes go by, and we said, oh, I'll see you later. And I walked about, oh, I didn't walk, you know, 50 steps. And I said, oh, that's John Sherba. He was a medic for recon, and I got to know him while I was in the rear. Mm -hmm. And I and I had his address, but I hadn't looked him up. And so I turned around and said, John. And he turns around, Lee, right? I said, yeah. So we, then we talked for about an hour and a half. Well, it turns out he was one of the guys who went to the first reunion for Ripcord. And he, he and I would be in contact. And he was suffering from, he had a lot of post-traumatic stress issues. Mm -hmm. I and mean, I went to visit him in his house. He's got a couple kids and his wife. And he's got loaded guns, literally, in all the corners. Loaded pistols up on the shelf here. He was, in my, my wife said, he's kind of a scary guy, isn't he? I said, well, yeah, sort of. But he saw a lot of bad things. And uh, and he, so he was suffering for that. And nobody was recognizing post-traumatic stress nice. at that point. But he was adjusting. He, he ended up running his own business as a con uh, concrete worker, uh, bricklayer. And he adjusted to his situation, and eventually he did go in for counseling, and and uh, he's doing, you know, he's doing as well as you can expect. He's had other issues, health issues. Mm -hmm. He ended up with hepatitis C from being in Vietnam, and he's on, so as a result, he's on 100% disability. But and he's had heart issues. But you know, mm -hmm. we're all getting old. But uh, and then and I would talk to him every so often, see him once in a while. We both run into each other at the Ducks Unlimited dinners because we both go to. And he says, oh yeah, they're starting this newsletter. That was Chip Collins starting up. He says, uh, I'll send you a copy. And he, he didn't, but then he'd talk about it. When we see him again, we'd talk about it. And then he says, yeah, he says, I've been talking to your boss, Chuck Hawkins. He says, uh, he's out there. I said, really? I said, say hi to him. I didn't have any special desire to go see anybody, but I'd talk about it. And again, it wasn't, that was it. And then finally, uh, he said he went to this reunion and had a good time, and, and there were only 12 guys. Mm -hmm. And that was up in North Jersey. And he had asked me if I wanted to go, and I had no interest. And then finally, it was in, I think in 92, Hawkins tracks me down through the internet. And you got a name like Widgescog, mm -hmm. it's pretty limited. Uh, and in 92, there were very few Widgescogs on the internet, because uh, the internet wasn't as wide right. as it was. Now there's a lot because they got all these fins that are on there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so Hawkins calls me up he, at home and he had my phone number. And so I ended up, I wasn't home at the time, I got a message. So then I called him back and uh, I was talking with him. And uh, we said, so he said, yeah, you gotta think about the unions. And then, then I started getting the newsletter. He made sure I got the newsletter. And so then by, uh, I think it was 97, and I had finally said, I gotta go to the reunion. And they were having one in Mobile, but I couldn't make it because I had already committed to running the Ducks Unlimited dinner, which is the same time period. So the following year, we gotta be in Atlantic City. I said, well, I have to go. Said, it's this close, I can't avoid it. And so I went to that one, and uh, I told Chuck I was coming, and he would end up being there. That's where I met Fred, uh, Frank Marshall, mm -hmm. the general, and, and I was very, a lot of anticipation, and I wasn't sure this was going to be fun. And uh, when I finally got there, I see all these old guys. I was 55, and, we, and I was old too, I forgot that. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and there was only about 25 or 30 guys there. And, uh, but I, you know, having, I worked with the public a lot, so I just treated it as, you know, I introduced myself and just chat them up and uh, 
I met, you know, so I started talking to guys and I found out that it really was very comfortable. And mm -hmm. uh, from then on, I, I've gone to everyone since. And, well, uh, when you've taken kind of a fairly important role in, in helping run the show. Well, and that came just because, again, I, I was always doing these things like I did Ducks on the Moon. I was committee chairman for uh, 30 years and I was also doing it for the Turkey Federation for another 20 years at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and I, so I was used to organizing events and putting them on, and and so I was going to these, and you know I felt kind of guilty. I'm not used to just sitting around, and uh, and then Fred said, "Well, you know, I really need. I'm going to need somebody to take over." He said, "I just can't do this," and so I volunteered. I said, "Well, I'll take it over," and at that time, Frankie had taken over the Frank Marshall had taken over the newsletter because mm -hmm. Chuck didn't have enough time to do it anymore. And uh, he was being criticized by some, oh, you don't get it out fast enough. Mm -hmm. And so, and that really, those are things that keep everything up. up. Right. And the, and the book had come out, too. So, um, so it's about 2006, and Fred said, well, here's what you, here's what you got to do. You do this, and you do this, and you look this way to figure out where you're going to be. He said, well, I've got this. I've got the hotel set up for the next couple of years, and, then, and we'll, we'll see about, you can take that over. And then he never relinquished that portion mm -hmm. of it. He, he really liked doing that. He did not like doing the day-to-day -day stuff with the reunion when people came in right. and stuff like that, which I had no problem with that. My wife, I'm lucky because you know she likes to do it. She said, "Well, to do all this stuff with me, and yeah. so it makes it really easy." And uh, and she did the same thing with me at Ducks Unlimited. And uh, you know, and she's the same woman that I married before I went to Nam. So mm -hmm. uh, there's a few of us. It's surprising yeah. that we've never messing up that stereotype. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's you know, and, and Gary Foster, same thing. He and his wife were married before they. Uh, Fred Gilbert, you know. And more and more, I find these guys. Yeah. Oh, I've encountered a fair number just across the different areas and yeah. kind of things. So. And and and, and, I, and people do get divorced. Yeah. And you know, and I a bunch of guys worked for me when I was in fishing game. And they never went to Nam, and they are all have been divorced, you know. <laughs> so there's other there's you know, Nam was not. To blame. It might have been auxiliary, but it was that marriage was probably going to go down anyway. It just might have got down a little faster. But uh, and like I said, I, I've always been very happy of the fact that you know, I picked the right woman. You know, and, <laughs> and she puts up with me. I couldn't ask for anything better. So, and that's that's how I ended up doing the reunions. And uh, yeah, I plan to do it as long as I'm physically able. So well, you, you do a really good job, and, yeah. and your wife does too. And uh, I certainly appreciate being able to come to these things. And if you're watching this and he's got the name tag just below where the camera is uh, for <laughs> Ripcord Reunion, and that is where, where we are uh, today as we're recording this. Uh, I'd like just to close here by thanking you for taking the time out of your regular duties to come in and talk to me. Well, I appreciate it. I uh, hope it helps. Certainly will. All right.